So I'm Forrest, I'm a junior, that's Emily, she's a senior, that's Eileen, she's also a senior, this is Nicole, she's also a senior. Um, we played Schubert's uh, Dante from his string quartet number 13, his Rosamund Quartet, um, and yeah, I guess that's really it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, Emily, Nicole, and Forrest are also all in the Vermont Youth Orchestra. Uh, Eileen doesn't spend her time there. She spends her summers, though, uh, conducting string quartets of her own that have been uh, performed by uh, ensembles throughout the state. So, and were you at last night? Yes. Did you do last night at? Uh, okay. So, and one of the things we're trying to do with our uh, the start of our general board meetings is to show off some of the good things that are going on in the school. Last week we had the uh, Lego Robotics, or last month Lego Robotics, and, and this month we. Start off with a, a little bit of Schubert. Excellent. So we're going to call the uh, meeting to order. Uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Mm. Pledge of Allegiance. Do you have a roll call? Do you have a roll call sheet in front of you? Oh, it's in your folder. Howard, I think there's a roll call sheet in your folder. It's in the pocket of your folder. Commissioner China? Here. Commissioner Curry? Here. Commissioner Dodson? Commissioner Garrison? Here. Commissioner Giannoni? Here. Uh, Commissioner Kirk? Here. Commissioner Clayman? Commissioner Matson? Here. Commissioner Porter? Here. Commissioner Seguino? Here. Commissioner Shumsky? Present. Commissioner Stoll? Present. Commissioner Truman? Here. Uh, student Representative Long? Here. Student, uh, student Representative Essig? So, I'd like to welcome everyone this evening, and before we get started with our meeting, um, we do have, uh, going to take a, a moment of silence to recognize a couple of district employees who we've lost since our last meeting. Um, just after our last meeting, Jeff uh, Liu, who's a longtime uh, custodian at Hunt, uh, passed away, and uh, this morning, um, Brenda Trackham, who uh, died uh, rather suddenly this morning and uh, causing quite a shock to uh, many in the, in the district. Um, and for those who know Brenda, a uh, big, warm-hearted person. And um, uh, if we could just take a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, we could have a motion to um, approve the agenda. Commissioner Curry, seconded by Commissioner Kirk. Uh, any amendments to the agenda? Hearing none, all in favor of the agenda, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, we have an agenda. Um, we now have time set aside for public comment. Um, a reminder that uh, public comment is uh, limited to three minutes per person, and we have 20 minutes uh, by, um, by policy set aside for, uh, for public comment. Um, and at this time, the board welcomes 
<clears throat> comments and questions from the public, including staff and students. We encourage you to express your opinions on matters concerning any subject relating to public education in general and the operations of the Burlington School District in particular. The board is very interested in the opinions expressed during the public comment period. However, this is not a time to engage members of the board in conversation or debate. Um, could someone pass the, uh, the sign-in sheet up? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, first up, we have uh, Jeff uh, Rossetti. Francis, uh, Francesca Vallea, Vieja, and then Helen Hosley. Jeff? My name is Jeff Rossetti. I support a 0% increase in the school budget. I believe that the school budget, six out of the last eight years, has been too high. Would like to think that you guys would support that also and be a little more responsible with the property taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Also Jeff. support, if you guys aren't getting paid any parking money. Up next, Francisca Vieja, Helen Hosley, then uh, Greg Kal uh, Kalinowski. You have to get really close to the microphone. Yeah, I'm secure. Yeah. Right, there you go. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Francesca Valella. I have been a history teacher at Burlington High School for the past four years. Last year, my full-time employee position was reduced in force. At this time, I was placed on a recall list. Meanwhile, due to the fellowships funded by the Partnership for Change, I was hired back for the 2014-2015 school year to BHS on a limited term contract. I took the LTE with the understanding that I would, due to my recall rights and an anticipated retirement of Terry Buner, regain a full-time position in 2016. To my horror, before leaving for winter break, I was informed that Terry's position will not be filled. Therefore, I will not have a job next year. What I find unsettling is the half-truths that the current budgeting process depends upon. The public is only informed of reductions in full-time contracts. In truth, BHS is losing 1.6 history positions, not 0.8. This omission may be common, but is also misleading. Remember, many of us are not just teaching positions. I am the advisor to the Student Planning Committee and BHS Heroes. SPC organizes all school-wide dances, Homecoming Week, the Talent Show, the Dodgeball Tournament, Spirit Week, and this year's newly added Teacher Pie in the Face contest, which I proudly took a pie in the face for. We, for student heroes, or sorry, for heroes, our community service group, we run the blood drive. We have also created a much needed scholarship program to support students interested in traveling for the YES program. In leading these two clubs, I take responsibility for 1,037 students. Commissioners, I'm here, ready, willing, and able to do the work for our students who are already asking what our plans are for next year. So again, let us measure what your paperwork cannot. In addition to the full-time contracts and limited term contracts, BHS is also losing the two clubs that tend to our school spirit and maintain our sense of community, pride, and place. It is not a hyperbole to say that I love Burlington High School. I'm challenged every day to become a better teacher and person, and I deeply appreciate the opportunity I have to serve Burlington families. Until recently, Burlington High School felt like a place of endless potential. Now it feels like a dying friend. Yes, I am here to ask you to, take, to reconsider the 1.6 cut to the Burlington High School History Department so I can continue my work. But more importantly, I'm here to ask you to accurately measure the losses this budget imposes on Burlington High School and our community, to take stock of your actions, and to begin again to care for our students. This budget, compounded with the brutal cuts from 2015, shows little care. 
please reconsider this path. Thank you, Francesca. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> Helen Hosley, Greg uh, Kalinowski, Kathy Chasen. Good evening. My name is Helen Hosley. I live in Ward 7, and I have three comments this evening. The school board meetings must be held in schools. By having this meeting in Contoy sends a strong message that the environment of the schools is not good enough for the school board for a few hours. It points to an elitist attitude as well as the message that the board isn't interested in public input due to the lack of accessibility at Contoy. If school commissioners and pub the public can't handle sitting in an impersonal atmosphere for a couple of hours, how do you think our children and staff feel when they're in that environment for eight plus hours a day? By the way, the setup at BHS last week's budget hearing worked really well. In regards to the pl replacement of the social workers with school psychologists, psychologists and social workers have completely different functions. And what we gain in evaluation efficiency uh, we lose and sacrifice in the human element of caring for those that require additional support in their lives. It's a bankrupt trade-off. I encourage the board to include social workers to keep the continuity until the right psychologist can be hired to perform both functions. And in order, for H in order to do so, HR needs to sharpen their skills and hire the right people. The board for the board members in favor of the 1.5 versus the recommended 2%, increase, I offer the following quote from a Ward 7 resident on the Front Porch Forum yesterday. Quote, as a parent of children who have already been underserved by the district, at what point will the continued deterioration of our schools force me to pull my family up by its roots and find a town that still cares about public education? End quote. It's clear that there is momentum building that is not in the best interest of our community. By opting for a modest half a percent, this board not only alienates long-standing supporters of the schools, but also remains intent on dismantling public education in Burlington. And lastly, to not invest the $30,000 to launch the new program, uh, STEAM, excuse me, STEM, it would be short-sighted and irresponsible. Although the world is demanding proficiencies in science, technology, engineering, and math, it would behoove us to include the vital and often overlooked discipline of art. Art engages the imagination. Without, the, without art, the other disciplines are only good ideas, and producing creative solutions is impossible. Fund the $30,000 and create STEAM, not a limited STEM. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Greg Kalinowski, Kathy Chasen, and Chip Hart. Good evening. First, I'd like to thank the school board for your service. It's, uh, pretty miserable task from my view. What I'd like to talk about is a fiscal responsibility. And I think based on the fact I know a number of people on the board, uh, you're really attending to that. But one thing I'd like you to be mindful of is the long-term sustainability. Because right now you're just dealing with a glitch. The past budgeting is a fact that we have to live with. Hindsight's 2020. you can see all the mistakes that were made. You need to be forward thinking, you need to look with a macro view, instead of standing in front of a tree, you need to look at the whole picture. Where you're at today, where you're gonna be tomorrow. You have a responsibility to the students and the taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Chase and Chip Hart, Linda Siegel. Thank you. Um, I've been reading Front Porch Farms shared across the city, and un unfortunately, Dr. Smith, I have to say that from reading some of them, I can see that some of our commissioners took no benefit from the um, how to be a better board training, and perhaps you could arrange for it to happen again. Um, I believe the cuts that have been chosen um, will put us out of compliance with our own highly acclaimed wellness policy. And thirdly, I'd like to read a letter that you received um, sent by Ginger Farinow, but it was written by Sophie Dodds, a sixth grader. I'll just read it at the beginning because it, it's an amazing letter and um, I'm sure you'll enjoy reading it on your own. When we were still in elementary school, teachers would tell us stories of this place we'd one day we'd be going to middle school. They'd tell us it was a place where you had more say in what you learned and studied. And they were, weren't lying, it is. But pretty soon, 
I'll be changing that is to a was. We all know about the budget crisis that's affected BSD schools recently. It's terrible and the way to fix it isn't clear to anyone. So we've resorted to this, cutting music and arts budgets, squeezing gym into two days a week, taking out healthy living and clipping language classes out of the sixth grade schedule entirely. But wait, did you hear about that new reading class we'll all be taking? Sounds great, right? Maybe. But I don't need another reading class. Language arts, social studies, and great teachers have prepared me for the years to come. I'm well aware that some people would certainly benefit from another class. However, we already have separate classes for those students who are ELL or need a little help in reading or math. On to the next subject, language. In sixth grade, after you've taken Spanish for five years in elementary school, which they just cut, might I add, no more Spanish for those elementary students. Yippee. Finally, you get to take French and continue your skills in Spanish, though neither language is Latin. They're both romance languages, which, whether you realize it or not, are expanding your knowledge of their root language, Latin. By the way, you get to college, and I hear they're cutting languages like likely going to ask about Sorry, I missed a line. High school, better, better luck next time, Vermonters. It, it's, she's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Chip Hart, Linda Siegel, Sarah McMillan. Uh, in the rules, it asks that we not address any of the board members directly, but I hope you'll forgive me for asking a board member a question because I just want to get a fact straight. Alan Madsen, how long have you been doing math counts? Pick a number. Five years. Five years. So I'm, I'm actually here not to talk about the school budget, um, tempting as it is. Uh, I'm actually here to thank Alan Madsen, uh, one of your board members, for work that he does in the schools for free, 7 a.m., two days a week, every week that school is open. He takes the middle schoolers at Hunt and at Edmonds through a program called Math Counts. It is, by certainly my understanding, the only opportunity for any kid up through eighth grade with any math uh, ambition whatsoever to expand his or her math horizons. Uh, the teams meet uh, each week and then they get to compete on a regional level and at a state level. Uh, last year, I can't speak about Edmonds because I just don't know, my kids go to Hunt, or went to Hunt. Uh, but last year, Hunt went from 12th place two or three years ago to fourth place regionally, Alan. And how'd they do in the state, do you remember? Eighth place, I think? Sixth place. Sixth place in the state, which is quite an achievement. Um, in the concept of the budget, uh, I, these budget talks are very painful for everybody, uh, no matter which side you're on, but I'm, I just want to come here and ex express my gratitude and my family's gratitude to Alan and people like Alan who are not only doing what you're doing now, a very thankless job, but he's going even above and beyond that and spending his time to help educate these kids. So that's, I'm here solely for that reason. My boys would be here, our boys would be here, but they are at home doing homework. <laughs> All right, so thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Chip. <laughs> Linda, uh, Sarah McMillan, and Lenore Broughton. Hi, my name is Linda Siegel. I'm a resident of Ward 5, and I've been a teacher in the Burlington District for 20 years, and I was a tutor for two years before that, mm -hmm. teaching English language learners. Um, I want to talk tonight about, I know that tonight you're here to vote on the budget, and I again want to just express my concern about cutting our social work positions. Um, our, um, again, I, I um, just could not do my job as a classroom teacher without the support that we receive for our most vulnerable students in our school district. But I'm actually here, I want to speak about another issue tonight. It recently came to my, today it came to my attention that in an effort um, to con have a consolidated calendar, the Champlain Valley um, district superintendents are thinking about um, eliminating the days off for the high holidays for Jewish, um, the Jewish high holidays, Rosh, um, Yom Kippur, and for Eid for our Muslim students. And as a member of the Jewish religion and a parent of a former Burlington student and a teacher in our schools, I would be very distressed to see this happen. 
My daughter always felt that she had to make a choice whether to attend services or to go to school on the high holidays, especially when she got to BHS and the academic pressure on her increased. As a staff member, I feel discriminated against to have to write subplans as I prepare for a major religious holiday. And as a teacher in our school who works with new Americans, I can vouch for the fact that my students all celebrate these days with their families and are not in attendance. In fact, I wish the district would go further with this policy and extend it to our Hindu students, which is now one of our largest minorities in our district, um, and close our doors on the holiday of Diwali. I feel like reversing this policy, which was a statement of religious equity in our communities, would really be a step in the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Sarah, Lenore, and Emma Jenkins. Hi, I'm Sarah McMillan. I'm a parent from Ward 7. And, um, I just wanted to say in regards to the budget that the current state admission of the Burlington School District is built around the idea that we should ensure that all students achieve their highest intellectual and personal potential. In these times of financial constraint, it's more important for, than ever that we keep our values and our aspirations in the forefront of our planning. We may need to move slowly, more slowly <laughs> towards these goals than we'd like, but we can and we should stay focused on long-term improvements and true excellence. In Burlington, we've long been moving toward a more personalized approach to education that respects the needs and goals of each student. In the upper grades, this is reflected through the work of the Partnership for Change, and in the elementary grades, grades it's been um, seen through the work in creating school choice in the two magnet schools and the possibility of a third STEM magnet school. Many among the community and staff have donated their time and their energy to make these initiatives successful. Achieving voluntary socioeconomic integration in the two magnet schools has been a very long process that has involved the entire community. And I ask the board to um, support the 2% budget, and indeed, to perhaps um, go forward with a budget that has an even larger increase and not undercut the ongoing efforts of the past decade. Specifically, I think that there are a few areas that could use improved funding um, that you may not have heard about from some of the other speakers, and one is the libraries. If we are really going to encourage personalized education and personal projects, there needs to be some place for kids to go, some place with resources, and some place and professional staff to help them pursue their particular interests. Right now, at the elementary schools, we have librarians having to close the library during the school day, um, thereby because they have to teach classes and there's no longer a para to keep the library open for students per pursuing individual work. Also um, on the table, especially in the 1% budget, is cutting um, STEM program funding um, at Flynn Elementary. I urge you to keep the budget amounts for STEM in the budget. The elementary programs are already weak in science and technology. A STEM magnet school is also an exciting long-term possibility for our district. We talk constantly about preparing our students for the 21st century, a goal which will be impossible to meet without a solid grounding in science and technology. As a community, we need to keep this conversation opening by continuing this important position at Flynn. And the third would be the magnet school coordinator. Um, eliminating this position outright seems to assume that the work of guiding parents through their options at the elementary level is done. It's not. This district is still undergoing rapid change with a third magnet school on the horizon. I urge the district to keep this position at least in a part-time capacity and allow us to um, build on the success of past years and not undercut it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lenore Broughton, Emma Jenkins, Graham Clark. Hi, um, my name is Lenore Broughton. I'm here, can you hear me? Yes. Um, to speak to you about the school budget um, and to uh, remind you of the fiscal responsibility which we have elected you to demonstrate. Um, I urge you, therefore, to vote for no more than a 1.5% increase in the budget for 2016. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Emma Jenkins, uh, Graham Clark, Joni uh, Picor. Hello, my name is Emma Jenkins. I teach second grade at Flynn, and I am also a first year teacher. I wanted so badly to get a job in BSD because I thought there was some revolutionary instruction happening through magnet schools. I wanted to be a part of that step forward in progressive education. So tonight I will read some of the words of my colleagues in support of investing in STEM. From Karen Vogel. As a K-5 math coach in Burlington School District, I have personally witnessed the power of STEM education. Individuals who are less successful in traditional learning situations shine when engaged in high quality STEM learning opportunities. I've watched students who typically exhibit challenging behaviors and low academic performance become energized about computer programming, exploring fractals in art and nature, catapult building, geodesic dome construction, and on and on. It is hard not to become an advocate for this type of education after watching marginalized students get opportunities to demonstrate their brilliance. STEM is a forward-thinking opportunity to empower our students to be the leaders, thinkers, and makers <coughs> of a changing world. Imagine that. From Nina Mador, speech and language pathologist at Flynn. One of my greatest moments was when one of my students, an English language learner with a language impairment and social communication deficits, as well as learning challenges, decided he wanted the after-school program to purchase a specific science-based video game, Spore. He spent several weeks researching and writing a proposal to justify how the game was connected to education and science themes. After writing up the proposal, he went on to present by himself to the principal and then again to the after-school coordinator. His hard work paid off and the game was purchased and a spore club was started in the after-school program. This was the perfect example of integrated real-world learning that targeted written language, oral language, and social language, and also integrated important habits of learning, asking, imaging, planning, creating, and improving. STEM is not just a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics initiative, but an equity initiative. When we shift the focus of education to student engagement, the most marginalized students will finally find success. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we go on, we have, we're at 20 minutes of public comment, um, which is when we would uh, call public comment to an end. How many more, How many more do we have? Uh, signed up, there are four more people. Motion to extend for 15 minutes. We have a motion on the floor to extend for 15 minutes from Commissioner Porter, seconded by Commissioner Seguino. Any comment? Uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposition? Motion passes. Uh, Graham, then Joni Picor, then Infinite Cochlesia. Good evening. My name is Graham Clark. I'm the principal at Flynn Elementary School. You have recently received letters from parents, community members, and Flynn teachers on the inclusion of part-time STEM positions at Flynn School. I wanted to share some data on that. When the first two magnet school academies were being launched, a citywide survey of parents was done by a local research company. One of the questions focused on what parent choices would be in terms of a magnet school, that being what would the focus theme be. Eight years ago, Burlington parents had STEM as their third choice. One and a half years ago, the same research firm did another citywide parent survey. The topic was around the possibility of creating a third elementary academy and or magnet school. Multilingual liaisons were again used to make sure that language was not a barrier to get a truly representative understanding of parents' viewpoints. The results this time were significantly different in 2013. STEM is now the overwhelming parental choice. 33% chose science, 29% math, 14% technology. These results were shared with the curriculum committee uh, in a very brief presentation last spring. STEM and STEM specific disciplines when added together in that survey topped all of the non-STEM topics by nearly a three to one margin. Not bad margin if you're putting something on a ballot. Uh, your budget discussion tonight, however, is not about starting or not another magnet school or academy. That is a much larger discussion that, if it would ever take place, would probably occur over months and months. There is, however, a $26,000 investment listed for a part-time STEM coach at Flynn. I say investment in that, like other parts of the budget, 
This is an educational service that is an investment in our future, in our students. However, unlike other line items, this $26,000, I believe, would also have a financial return. Last spring and summer, Flynn School raised $21,000 from grants for environmental and STEM programs. When a donor sees that the district has skin in the game, they're more willing to provide grants. I would expect that that money would be doubled or tripled uh, within the year. I say that all students would benefit because STEM itself is a diversity and equity initiative. Uh, President Obama, Republican and Democratic governors uh, refer to it as that. I believe that thinking of money for STEM versus programs focused on ELL students or students who happen to have an IEP or students of color is falsely an either or. It should be seen as a both and. In the past three years, Flynn teachers have participated in more than 2,000 hours of STEM professional development. <coughs> I think this is so because Flynn teachers have seen our students respond to engaging learning that is hands-on and minds-on, learning that seeks to integrate and make connections between literacy and the sciences, connections between the arts and the sciences. We need to broaden and strengthen our entryways for learning. For many students, the door to literacy is not through books and writing, it is through STEM or the arts. These 2,000 hours of STEM PD have not been at the expense of other districts. Graham, we need you to finish up, please. Yes, 60% of our teachers have also participated in the uh, Washington Consulting Group anti-racism workshops. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joni, Infinite Cochlesia, Vince Brennan. Good evening, I'm Joni Pecor. I have the privilege of teaching fifth grade at Flynn School. Um, I teach on a team, and I'm here tonight to um, read some thoughts from one of my teammates who was unable to attend tonight. Dear school board members, my name is Nicholas Mack, and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Flynn. This is only my second year teaching at Flynn. Before coming to the school, I taught for six years at Integrated Arts Academy, one of Burlington's two magnet schools. The ongoing professional development we received at IAA was some of the most valuable training I have ever experienced. Why, you may ask. Because the entire staff was working together to create a uni unified curriculum points that were taught in all subject areas, including music, PE, and art. The result was a coherent theme that shaped every aspect of the student experience. The transition to an art magnet was not immediate but rather a gradual learning process. The IAA had an art coach who guided the staff through the transition. She helped the staff stay focused on the same goals, align the curriculum around the central theme, led us through valuable supplemental art trainings. The coach was an invaluable asset. Flynn has already invested more than 500 hours of professional development in STEM or STEAM-based learning. The community survey make results clear. Flynn has a strong parent support Flynn has strong teacher support. We just need a little additional support, a little coaching, and a commitment from the district to help make the leap to a successful STEAM, STEAM or STEM programs. Let's be clear. IAA does not only teach art, nor will Flynn only teach STEM subjects. The purpose of the model is to create a unified curriculum that teaches content in accordance to grade level standards. A STEM school a STEM magnet school at Flynn would be a powerful affirmation of the district's goal to prepare 21st century learners. Flynn is ready to take this leap. Please support this portion of the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Infinite, then Brent's. Uh, Vince. Uh, it's cold pleasure, Patrick. I'm sorry. It's okay. It runs with pleasure. I just came from watching CNN 1, CNN 2, ESPN, uh, House Committee meeting on uh, uh, proceedings on Homeland Security, and uh, uh, in the Senate, they're talking about the Keystone Pipeline, just to put things into perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm here to, to support the two and a half, or however high we can uh, contribute to the schools. Um, I'm, where I'm from, they say you need to pay like you weigh. Uh, and so 
if you want to be the second best city, you know, to live in the country or raise your kids and all that stuff, you, we have to pay for that. Um, and so that, you know, part of the reason why I'm, I'm in support of the increase. Um, and I know Stephanie has read it, but I wonder if anyone else on the board has read uh, the recent report on uh, the unfair and unequal discipline in Vermont schools. Uh, and if you don't think that has anything to do with social workers, then I disagree. And I suggest you think again. Uh, and the, the social workers are invaluable. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Infinite. Uh, Vince Brennan. Thank you. Um, Vince Brennan, Ward 3 City Councilor. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Smith uh, for coming last night to the City Council meeting to present the uh, budget. It was very informative. Uh, many of my colleagues, most of my colleagues, uh, were in favor of the 2% uh, increase. And uh, I encourage all of you to uh, consider the 2% increase and then some. Um, all the people that have spoken tonight have, uh, it, it seems like we have two items in front of us. Uh, and both of those uh, opportunities that you're presenting are not meeting the needs of uh, the Burlington School District. We're not talking about wants, uh, the needs of uh, the, the students. And I think that's unfortunate in many ways because uh, the system that we're actually under, the, that uh, you're, you're in, uh, being presented with uh, within the state uh, is certainly broken. Our uh, mayor was uh, in a press conference today with all the other city mayors uh, in the state uh, urging uh, the state legislature to find a better system and urging this system. So there is going to be a new system and uh, I just wonder you as a board if you have reached out uh, to the state and to express those needs because uh, the, the driving costs are having classrooms across the state averaging between two and nine students. So that includes our students, which you're looking to increase up to 20, 25 uh, students. And I would just say that uh, the, the needs of our students and the, where the pressures that we're actually experiencing are because we have 300 plus school districts in this state and having classroom sizes of two to nine, there is that pressure that's being put on our system. So having said that, we don't wanna throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, all the work that's been done and that has been expressed tonight to create equity uh, and urging equity to be uh, in place in, in our, our city, uh, we don't want to unravel it knowing that it, there's going to be another system. And you should be advocating for the needs. We have 50 some odd languages and you're taking language out. Engl uh, having a language, a second language in the schools was a stabilizer where all students were coming together, learning a language together. So I really hope that you will support the 2% and I know there's a few of you that uh, have some items. Uh, listen to what those items are uh, amongst your colleagues and uh, vote for them. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Uh, we have a couple minutes left. I don't know if there's if there anyone else for um, public comment. Bob, please come forward. Hi, if you'd state your name, please. <clears throat> My name is Dan Feeney, F-E-E-N-E-Y. Um, Dr. Smith, thanks for taking on the task at hand. It's a challenge up here. Uh, I feel as though I'm in the minority tonight uh, with the other eloquent speakers about all the needs that Burlington School District has on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm not here to argue the points that there are a lot of needs here in Burlington. Um, what I am here to try and do is to give my point of view that six of you were in voted in in the last six, eight months to um, help straighten out a fiasco here at the school district. 
Um, rounding errors, $18,000 a kid five years ago, six years ago, it was $13,000 a kid. 5,000 times 4,000 kids, math, five times four is 26 zeros, that's $20 million. If that money was going to my kids and I had three daughters, one's out, one's a senior, one's a sophomore at the high school, if that was going to Mr. Chandler at Edmonds Elementary School or some of the kids' teachers now, I, I wouldn't have much argument. The teachers, for the most part, are doing an exceptional job. The district office is out of control with expenditures. And I encourage you to listen to the folks here about the programs. I'm, they're smarter than I am on the specific programs. But there is so much waste at the corporate level, district level, um, that there's got to be some money there to stick to that one and a half level. A half a percent here or there is a rounding error, in my opinion. I'm not here to, to squabble over that. But it's a principle. The school district has gotten, over the last seven or eight years, everything you've asked for. Everything. And then some. At some point, there has to be enough is enough and just start with what we elected you to do was to um, get the finances under control <clears throat> and then come back to the Burlington School, uh, Burlington voters with a plan of action. And I thank you for your service. It's a very difficult job, but that's why you know, ran for what you got, and I wish you good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Bob? Uh, Leon? Hello. I'm <clears throat> Hi, uh, uh, my name is Leon Walls. I'm a... Uh, Professor of Elementary uh, Science Education at uh, the University of Vermont. And I just wanted to make a, just a general comment, statement about uh, STEM uh, education. Um, and I come at it from a perspective of the, the student. Um, equity in science education requires that all students are provided with equitable opportunities to learn science and become engaged in science and engineering practices. With access to quality space, equipment, and teachers to support and motivate that learning, and engagement and adequate time spent on science. In addition, the issue of connecting to students' interests and experiences is particularly important for broadening participation in science. There's increasing recognition that the diverse uh, customs and orientations that members of different cultural communities bring both to formal and to informal science learning contexts are assets on which to build, both for the benefit of the student and ultimately of science itself. For example, researchers have documented that children reared in rural agricultural communities like those here in Vermont Who's experienced, who experienced intense regular interactions with plants and animals, develop more sophisticated understandings of ecology and biological species and do, uh, than do urban and suburban children of the same age. Others have identified connection between children's culturally based storytelling and their engagement in argumentation and science inquiry. And some of these researchers have also documented pedagogical means of using such connections to support students, science learning and promote educational equity. Recently, both the Common Core State Standards for Mathematics and the Next Generation Science Standards, which has been adopted by the state of Vermont, have called for more and deeper connections among the STEM subjects. The NGSS explicitly includes practices and core disciplines, ideas for engineering alongside those for science, raising the expe expectation that science teachers will be expected to teach science and engineering in an integrated fashion. The expertise of educators working in classrooms and in after in out-of-school settings is a key factor. Some would say, and I agree, that it is the key factor in determining whether integrated STEM education can be done in ways that produ produce positive outcomes for students. One limiting factor to teacher effectiveness and self-efficacy is teachers' content knowledge in the subjects being taught. In short, programs that prepare people to deliver integrated STEM st instruction need to provide experiences that help these educators identify and make explicit to their students connections among the disciplines, these educators will also need opportunities and training to work collaboratively with their colleagues, and in some cases, administrators or curriculum coordinators will need to play role, a role in creating these opportunities. Finally, some forms of professional development may need to be designed as partnerships among and between educators, STEM professionals, and researchers. The University of Vermont's teacher education program, program realizes it indeed has a responsibility to provide support and assistance to educators in order for effective STEM education uh, be made available to the children of Vermont. It is in response to this call that I am currently working with uh, the after school program at Flynn Elementary School to do just that. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak here this evening. Thank you, Leon.
We've reached the, the end of our uh, public comment time. That's, we've reached out. Everyone uh, who has signed up in advance has, uh, has, has spoken. Was there anybody else who wanted to speak? I, I were, there, were there further? We have two additional people who would like to speak. Can I make a motion? I don't speak. I'd move to allow the two people who have indicated interest to speak. Second. Uh, all in favor? Or any discussion? I would like to say something. Commissioner Stoll? I, I really appreciate everyone coming and expressing their views, and I'd like to also let you all know that we as a board have had no time to discuss this, and it is really an important issue for us to do. We've tried to talk about it on the phone. We've tried to get to a point where we can come to um, a conclusion, and I just would implore us to get to the discussion and get to talking about it so that we can respond. So I, I'll be voting against the addition of this just because I think we need to get on to our discussion. But thank you all for coming. Any further discussion? Patrick? Yes, I'm sorry. I'd like to give Thank the two you. people a chance to speak, but then I'd like, to, I'd like for us to cap it at that point so we can move forward, and I hope that everyone has had a chance to speak, but I'd like to at least give them a two, the last two people a chance. Any further discussion? All in favor of extending for, uh, I'll say no more than six minutes, as we have two, two additional people, please uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? Two. Uh, we need a two-thirds majority to change the rule, but that's two-thirds. Uh, Bob? Uh, thank you for this opportunity. In uh, all honesty, I was uh, out in the snowbank fumbling around with my nickels and dimes to get into the uh, meter there, so I apologize for being late. My name is Bob Abbey. I'm a third grade teacher at Flynn Elementary and the president of the Burlington Teachers Union. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of all concerned teachers, paras, and especially those who are also citizens of the city of Burlington and taxpayers. Tonight we will discuss proposed cuts to the school, most of them having a direct impact on teachers, students, and families. These cuts will increase some class sizes, reduce student offerings, reduce classroom para support, and eliminate some mental health safety nets used by our neediest children. While I believe that interim superintendents' proposed cuts have been well-researched and thoughtfully explained, I remain concerned about a majority of the cuts uh, focus, uh, focus on uh, working, those working directly with students every day. When I've met with Dr. Smith, he has reassured me that upon concluding his work putting together this initial budget, he promises to then look more deeply into how we spend money outside the classrooms. He understands the need to closely scrutinize every taxpayer dollar that is spent on administrative cost. He has stated that he expects administrative reorganization reallocation of budgeted department funds, and reassessment of central office responsibilities. Simply put, what can we do to most affect student learning? I believe he has some work ahead. Under ex-superintendent Jeannie Collins' failed leadership, money budgeted for central office at BSD over the last few years has exploded. When we compare the money we spend on central office to South Burlington, it makes you wonder. South Burlington spends $1,760,000. We spend $4,264,000. While South Burlington is 20% smaller, $2,300,000 more? Why? Compared to a district like Winooski, with similar student challenges, we spend 6.2% of our total budget on central office. They spend 3.8. What are we getting for the extra millions, and could some of that money be put back into classrooms? Jeannie Collins' approach to tackling difficult educational issues was to throw money at it and to hire more administrators. You can't pass through central office without bumping into a handful of directors, all making between ninety dollars and $110,000 a year. Some department directors and assistant directors have huge budgets to use as they please. It is time to now ask what effect all this money has had on the student performance and improved learning. I count on Dr. Smith and all of you 
to help make sure that we do that. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Nick. Good evening. Um, out of respect, Commissioner Stoll, for your request, I'll, I'll slim down uh, my list. Um, it doesn't really matter whether the 1.5 or 2 percent budget um, passes or I support um, either, um, simply because I'll be losing uh, a wonderful colleague sitting here tonight, Francesca Valella, to either budget. Um, my, my colleagues in the science department won't be able to do labs because of freezes um, that are already enacted. Um, so I really didn't have much to say or think about um, until um, infinite spoke and, and brought up um, the, uh, the report that J.D. has put together called Kicked Out. And um, it made me think of the diversity and equity minutes that I've been reading that uh, Commissioner Seguino um, chairs and uh, the discussions around restorative justice, um, the discussions around um, how do we change uh, a discipline policy that keeps kids in schools. Um, and I can tell you from the experience that I had um, in the beginning stages of doing that, um, it's, it's hard work, and it's, it's not something that you just do, it's, it's a culture that you create. Um, I know that uh, Lizzie McDonald gave a, a, a wonderful presentation. We were, I was very fortunate to work with Lizzie last year <coughs> as she was working with Karen um, Basting, um, uh, who just retired, and I had a wonderful experience working with her last year as well to start working on community justice and uh, restorative justice practices. Um, I know, Commissioner um, Charlie, we've, we've talked about this. Um, but it takes a commitment. It takes a financial commitment to do it. Uh, you have to train people to do it. You have to have people there to coordinate it. Um, and I would hate to see that some of the um, ideas coming out of committees, some of the ideas that are being um, very progressive. Um, I know that um, Commissioner Curry was right next to Jay Diaz as we were talking about this and down in Montpelier. Um, it isn't just something you say you're going to do and it just happens. Um, for example, last year when we were having an issue with theft and we looked at our policy, and our policy was very vague about theft. We had to create a multi-tiered approach to what theft um, discipline would look like, when we implemented that change, um, we had the whole school stop and discuss what is the impact of theft on our community. We didn't just change a policy, we stopped and had a discussion, a conversation about what that meant. And the students had a voice then, the students had a chance to talk about their experiences and what they wanted their school to look like. Um, Lizzie was directed by me when she asked how she could help this year um, to some colleagues that were having issues in their classes. And those um, circles, those discussion circles, were incredibly valuable to both the students and to the faculty to see some other ways to build community and build trust. I know that you're a committee um, that's been hearing a lot about trust. And I know that you want to rebuild trust. We could certainly have a personal conversation about that. Um, but I hope that you really think about, because that 1.5 will diminish professional funding, that's where this is all coming from, professional development funding, um, I fear that these things might get lost in a 1.5. So I would urge you to support the two, if for no other reason, to take some of these initiatives and move them forward with the kind of professional development and support that they'll need to be successful rather than something that won't be successful and then will get lost. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. At this point, uh, the board sets aside time for uh, reflection on public comment. Um, I would like to just say before we go to reflection to be uh, mindful of uh, Commissioner Stoll's um, urging that we, we be quick, but we do have uh, board reflection if there's anyone who would like to reflect on anything you heard in public comment. Commissioner Shumsky. Um, Bob, I don't like paying for parking after 6 o'clock in Vermont either, and so just to remind everyone with the core downtown parking is just across Main Street. That's free over on that side. So when you come here, it's some of the closest parking. Just make sure you're on that side of Main Street and you don't have to pay for it. Um, I, um, and also the parking garage, if you don't want to stay for our whole meeting, you're only going to be here for two hours. The parking garage up on Bank Street, two hours free. You can go in there. You just got to get out of here by two hours. Um, and I just want to touch on one issue, which is the STEM, STEM issue, which a lot of people have talked about tonight. And I'm not stating a position either way regarding STEM, but I, I think... You know, there was, I think it was Commissioner Seguino who first talked about STEM and her concerns for it, is that I, I haven't heard anyone talk against STEM investment within our district. Um, what the concern was is that we have seen in this district for too many years haphazard spending and direction of spending. And I think what I heard from my fellow commissioners at last week's meeting is that we want a comprehensive approach. We talked about do we want Flynn to go to become a STEM magnet school? <coughs> So what we have to do is within our district is what do we want before we spend money in STEM? What is the long-term approach? Where do we want to be in one year, three years, five years, and 10 years? When we don't have those questions answered, we shouldn't be spending for the one year. 
because it's possible if we want STEM to be something in 10 years, we might be misinvesting money this way this year when it's not taking us to our 10-year goal. So I, I've only heard positive comments from this board in terms of STEM support. And I think we just need to be careful because it needs to be part of a comprehensive long-term approach. Thank you. Any other reflection? Mr. Dodson. I'd like to share quickly. I've uh, thought a lot about this budget and it's, uh, um, these are very difficult times and um, I just think it's really important that we try to come together as we have these discussions. So I threw this together and try to read it quickly. Bear with me. Burlington is a complex, incredibly heterogeneous community, and we are going through some serious growing pains. I'm very concerned by the folks who are spreading fear by stating that a 1.5% increase represents a lack of commitment to quality education and that families are going to move to the suburbs. I believe that we here in the big city need to gird ourselves for a rigorous debate about municipal spending that might play itself out differently than it does in the suburbs. It seems disingenuous to me for one to move into the city with all of its messiness and then expect funding conversations to play out like they do in the suburbs. We will never have our conversations look like they do in Shelburne and Charlotte, but I believe that we can create a school district that on the whole provides a richer educational experience that better prepares a student for the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century. And yes, that will take a commitment of dollars, but increased spending doesn't automatically equate to increased outcomes. Many in this community feel betrayed by the BSD. Working class folks feel betrayed by a district that they sometimes believe cares more about privileged transplant families and our concerns, yes, I'm including the Dodsons in that group, than it cares about the working people who have been here for generations. Low-income and minority families feel completely neglected, marginalized, and disenfranchised. Fiscal accountability and transparency folks are flabbergasted at what they've learned about the lack of financial controls and competent management. These are not my opinions, but rather what citizens and taxpayers have told me. I understand these people's concerns. I'm trying to apply a five to 10 year vision to this challenge. This is bigger than the 2016 budget. Things are gonna be tough for some time coming. We do not have the foundation in place to lean on the entire community to dig into their pockets and really stretch themselves in pursuit of educational quality. They have little reason to trust that we are spending the money the way we claim we are. There are limited objective outcomes to show that we are getting great bang for the buck. High quality data collection in a way that is transparent and easily accessible has been in short supply in the district. But all of this is changing. This board has done important work. We have a great finance director. We have passionate and committed teachers. We have a very competent, thoughtful interim superintendent who based this year's budget on prioritized spending gathered from community input rather than just simple cost cutting. We're in the process of hiring a permanent superintendent and I'm sanguine about that outcome. I believe it is possible that the progressive liberal democratic alliance could pass a 2% budget despite the protests of a meaningful critical mass of voters. But I believe there's ample evidence that it would be an ephemeral, potentially pyrrhic victory. This year is tough, but next year will be tougher. There's no reason to think that help is coming from the state or feds in the near term. Our infrastructure, particularly the high school facility, needs investment now. Next year we have teacher contract negotiations and those are going to be tumultuous and probably expensive. I believe that 1.5 is a more judicious economic stance and it sets us up much better to ask for tax increases in the future. My stance is one of unity. The challenges in this district are huge and we can never address them as a fractured polity. We need to have a little bit of patience to heal and unite this community. I'm not concerned about only convincing people to spend more money this year. I want our commissioners to have the political capital to spend the requisite amount of money in the future when I think we'll really need it. Some might claim that I'm not representing our ward with the support for the 1.5% increase. No commissioner could represent every voice in a ward in this diverse city. But I come to my politics and my decisions in a genuine and deeply rooted manner. My father didn't grow up like I've grown up. He grew up the hard way. Orphancy, foster care, abuse, racism, etc. He is a Marine. He is a fiscal conservative and social moderate. Many of his male friends from childhood, all African American, were dead or strung out by age 50. My dad had his own struggles, but he worked hard every day of his life, watched where the pennies went, and put three kids through college. You could count on one hand the peers of my parents who can claim such an outcome. This is not a pull yourself up by your bootstrap story. It is just my dad's reality. My father's on a fixed income. He cares about education, and he cares about his grandchildren, but he understands and appreciates 1.5%. He happens to live in our ward, and my experience has taught me that his perspective is not singular. And although not exactly the same, I think his worldview and perspective resonates with many folks in our ward and across the city. For many reasons that I hope one can appreciate, I feel compelled to deeply consider my father's point of view in this budget season. I love this community. These are hard conversations and decisions. I feel like I am threatening some long-held friendships with my budget stance this year, and I can't understand it. I respect and embrace the messiness of democracy, and I separate my friendships from my politics. When I'm in a bad spot, 
I turn to my friends for compassion and humanity, not political agreement. I hope and pray that we can get through this trial, regardless of where we stand. Children will need to be schooled and raised up right after the vote, and they will continue to look to us to model the way. That's all. For the reflection. Seeing none, uh, moving on to the board report. Um, first of all, uh, last, our last board meeting, there were uh, five questions that were uh, brought forward by uh, Kathy Chasen, and I just wanted to give brief um, responses to these. There are a longer response right now, but I uh, wanted to give these in, in, um, in public. First question was regarding deliberations and negotiations um, in the funding of the purchase of the St. Joseph School. Uh, at this point, uh, there, there is discussion for the purchase of St. Joseph School, but only uh, exploratory discussions. There's been no contract and just uh, in part of holding out all of the options that exist. Um, if the board is interested in purchasing St. Joseph's, here's a re recommendation for how, the f uh, how to finance the purchase and, estimate, uh, and estimated improvements over the first five years. The purchase is to do a long-term purchase at uh, $200,000 per year uh, for approximately, uh, I'm just reading this, 11 years. Wrong years. 12 years. <laughs> 12 years. I'm sorry, it reads 1,112 on my, my paper here. Um, and this will be need, uh, need to be included in the regular budget for fiscal year 17. Improvements, the minimum required improvements for accessibility based on previous estimates are on the table now. These, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, the total approximately of 2.3 million to occupy, including a 20% contingency fund. Um, funding, we could use 1. million, uh, 1.6 million dollars from the task le lease for initial work, combined with funding from capital improvements, bond, and preventative maintenance. Second question was, decisions made um, and funding sources identified to plan for the potential overcrowding at Hunt. Um, I'm going to point people quickly to Paul Irish who re reviewed this information and presented it at the June 3rd uh, ITC meeting, and those are available uh, online. The notes from that are. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to uh, push people. It's available through board docs, uh, the, his detailed proposal for uh, um, uh, hunt overcrowding, potential for that. Uh, the third is, question was uh, regarding decisions made, a timeline, and funding sources identified to improve the accessibility concerns at BHS. Um, there has been an initial presentation to the board, um, to the ITC committee of the board, about accessibility needs at BHS, and those documents were uh, recently shared at the November 18th ITC meeting. Um, additionally, at the September 16th ITC meeting, um, there's a presentation about the design work for BHS, which would address accessibility as one of the design goals. Um, and again, those in, that information is available uh, on board docs for the November 18th ITC and uh, September 16th ITC committee meetings. Uh, fourth question was funding and plans for providing Common Core training to the staff. Uh, Common Core training started uh, over two years ago and continues as ongoing theme for professional development. A variety of uh, professional development is, uh, I'm sorry, the funding for the professional development is a combination of both local and title funds. A variety of professional development is available to teachers, including in-service workshops facilitated by district uh, local presenters, staff meeting and PLC, training sessions, book club, summer curriculum alignments, and attendance at local and regional conferences. Um, uh, Another question was the funding and plans for providing training to the staff on personal learning plans as required by Act 77. Uh, the director of curriculum has secured a grant in the amount of $26,500 for school year 14-15. Uh, this grant covers the registration, subs, mileage, and materials supp uh, supplies for an eight-member district team to attend monthly professional development focused on the personalized learning plan aspects of uh, Act 77. Uh, addition, um, from what I have here, this is also a uh, partnership for change has been uh, engaged in that work as well. Um, plans for funding for the relocation of the on top and horizon students and staff. Um, again, uh, if you look to the December 16th ITC minutes, uh, the minutes noted the commissioners discussed ideas with respect to the space of horizon and on top programs. The program will have will need uh, to leave the Taft building by June 30th, 2016. It was noted that the programs can be considered as separate entities with needs that can uh, that may not require co-location. This may be an advantage as the district may be able to consider how to better support programs for special education needs at on top independently of the issues with horizons. 
And again, uh, further discussion of that is on um, uh, the December 16th ITC minutes. And finally, breakdown of costs and funding for uh, the, uh, the resignation of Superintendent Collins. There's a $225,000 buyout spread over fiscal year 15, 14 and 15, uh, plus applicable taxes amounting to uh, roughly 60, I'm sorry, roughly $20,000. Uh, I do want to note to uh, folks that the um, elections are coming up for uh, school board. We, um, <clears throat> there is a change as with city council, we're moving from 14 to 12 school board members. Uh, there will be one from each of the now, now eight wards and four from each of the districts. The ward seats are two years, uh, will be um, elected in odd number of years, so elected in 15, again in 17, 19, et cetera. The, uh, did I say that wrong? The you district seats. The district seats, I do this every time. The district seats are odd years. This year uh, will be elected then 17, 19. The ward seats are going to be elected on even number of years with the exception of this first one, which would be a three-year term, so elected in 15, then elected in uh, 18, 20, uh, 22, et cetera. Um, at this point, there are petitions that are available at the clerks are actually online. They need to be turned into the clerk's office by the 26th of um, uh, January, if you'd like your name on the ballot for anyone interested, either uh, current board members or anyone out in the in the community. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to um, uh, to Howard for uh, discussion of a ballot resolution. Uh, first item has to do with um, making sure that we um, retain the flexibility to use the one-time proceeds from um, leasing of the Taft building to, and apply them towards future uh, capital. Uh, purposes and uh, purposes that are um, in accordance with a, an original understanding in a letter um, um, with the state uh, <coughs> and as far as a commitment for those funds. So the proposed language that will allow us to uh, establish a fund to set aside uh, um, these proceeds for that purpose uh, st states as follows. Shall the school district be authorized to establish a fund for the purpose of relocating its horizons and not top programs and meeting other infrastructure needs and deposit into this fund the proceeds from the leasing of the Taft School Building. This is on the agenda tonight because it would need to be a, um, a separate um, item on the, the ballot in March in order to uh, make it possible to create this fund. No, uh, Nathan, if you wanted to add anything to that before I cover it, okay. Commissioner Matson. <coughs> Do we need to move that we put this, that we either put this on the ballot or ask the city council to put it on the ballot? Do we need a formal action of the board to do this? Um, you need to ask the city council to put it on the ballot ultimately because this is not a, a tax issue specifically, so they have um, jurisdiction as that's how, the way it's been explained to me. Then I would move that we put this, that we ask the city council to put this initiative on the ballot. That's a motion? Yes. Do we have a second for the motion? Second by Commissioner Curry. Uh, would you like to speak to it, Commissioner Yeah, um, I think this is important if this is what we need to do. When we leased Taft, it was even a stated motion, uh, stated, uh, a statement was made by the board that we would do this with these funds and the funds, you know, so that the funds could be protected for those programs. And so I think this really is in the spirit of what the board had um, said some time ago. And, if it's needed, I think we should do it. Uh, Commissioner Kirk. Yeah, real quick, I, I want to second what Alan said because I do re recall this was the whole purpose of these, this $1.6 million. Um, and when, the, when we, uh, we have a, an unexpected influx of cash, we should make sure that we do put it aside for the purpose of what it's used for and not for the purpose of, of and without, without the purpose of it being used as as revenue for, for the ability to overspend or under budget. Mr. Shumsky? Yeah, I just want to note that I, get, I was opposed to the sale of the TAP, um, the lease of the TAP building. However, I will be voting in favor of this specifically because of my concern for the horizon on top programs and protecting them. Commissioner Porter. Um, yeah, I'd just like to better understand as to you know, why through, what makes this unique to have to go to the ballot? compared to all the other transactions that we conduct. Um, so what makes this unique that it has to go back to the voters? 
if we don't take specific action, we'll have no choice but to apply it as a general operating revenue. It just rolls over into the general fund. And so this cre uh, it's, if you want to designate it in some other way, it requires this kind of so this, is it the this was the advice of council that we had to, to do it. Is it the creation way. of the new fund that requires the ballot vote? That's my understanding, Nathan, if you want to add to that. <clears throat> Sorry, Nathan, put you on the spot there. Um, the, the key issue is essentially <laughs> reserving that revenue for the specific purpose, and that if we don't reserve the revenue for that specific purpose, then once we have our audited FY15 um, figures, any revenue that is uh, unassigned and is available in fund balance just has to be treated as a general revenue. And um, so in order to ensure that this doesn't become just uh, unassigned fund balance, we need to designate it. We need to assign it to this, this specific purpose. Do we have a policy in place that leads to this type of decision? Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have a, uh, an, a, an, a policy in place that leads us to this decision? Should these come up in the future? So this is a common thing that would, you know, as we have to do these things, this is the policy that we follow in, in moving these forward. Um, to, first of all, I don't know how common this is, a sale of a, of a property or a long-term lease of a property like this. Um, but I, we, to my knowledge, we didn't, don't have a specific policy regarding that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's correct. And um, adopting, a, you know, establishing and adopting a specific fund balance policy is one of the things that was uh, recommended uh, by our auditor and something that we'll be coming back to you on. But obviously, time is of the essence in this case, and uh, we can't wait to put together a more comprehensive policy because we would miss the deadline to get this question on the ballot. Further question or comment? The uh, motion in front of us is to refer to uh, City Council for the inclusion on the March ballot the following language. So, shall the school district be authorized to establish a fund for the purpose of relocating its horizons and on top programs and meeting other infrastructure needs and deposit into this funds the proceeds from the leasing of the Taft School Building? All in favor of the, of the proposal, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, early uh, retirement incentive. Um, one of the things that we have been uh, concerned about uh, is making sure that we have enough time uh, to uh, get out um, and do the kind of recruiting that will attract uh, the, the most talented and most diverse possible um, pool of candidates for openings that we will have. We are expecting a number of retirements. Um, and, and Many of those retirements will be in areas um, where uh, we will be replacing um, those folks. We're not, um, we're not simply absorbing all of the um, uh, planned retirements. And so it's very important um, in order to uh, put ourselves in the best position to move forward efficiently on this that we know who it is who's planning to retire. <coughs> so I want to make sure, first of all, that what I'm talking about is not what is often referred to as an early retirement incentive. In other words, we're not proposing to put forward an incentive to encourage people to, who were not already thinking of retiring to retire. We're simply um, proposing to put uh, forth a modest incentive for people to tell us early um, so that we know uh, what, what we need to know in order to make the best use of our funds in targeting them to legitimate vacancies and not have to guess at it or not um, have to wait in some cases until um, a late letter and then start in May for example, looking to fill a key position. So um, the proposal uh, that I have, and I actually have um, embellished a little bit um, since then, because I'd like to, um, as I've thought more about it because of the timing and talked more um, internally about the timing, um, I'm actually um, proposing kind of a, a two-tiered approach. Um, would, that would be a, um, early, if we received notice in the form of a letter of resignation for pur purposes of retirement <clears throat> by January 31st, that that would translate to an, um, an $1,800 um, payment. Um, that would be um, uh, this year, so it would be part of, of the uh, salary. Um, that notification by February 20th uh, would result in a $1,500 um, payment that would um, come out of uh, funds from the savings of that retirement after July 1st. So I want to uh, actually front load it as much as possible and, um, and create an incentive for people to notify us early. We actually 
our, the normal hiring cycle would begin next week um, if we're going to do the full, um, go through the full process in terms of uh, putting ourselves in the best position to uh, have access to the most talented candidates. So I would like to uh, get board authorization to move forward with that program. Commissioner Shumsky. Do you have an estimate for how many people you anticipate taking advantage of this and what the cost would be? Um, the, I think the maximum number of people on the, um, the list that we have, I mean, it, it depends on a few factors, but it might be 15 to 20. So it would be that number times the amount we're talking about. Seeing no further questions, um, we, uh, I guess we would need to make a motion if, uh, if anyone would like to make a motion for the proposal from uh, uh, Superintendent Smith. Commissioner Stoll. Uh, I move that um, we put forth uh, the superintendent's notice of early retirement incentive policy forward. We have a second. Second, uh, Commissioner Seguino. Any, would you like to speak to it, Commissioner Stoll? Uh, no, I think it sounds like a good idea. I think it will allow us to do all the things um, Superintendent uh, Smith said it would, and I, I think it makes good sense. Commissioner Dotson. Yeah, I just want to say I think this is a, an incredibly thoughtful um, and insightful initiative on the part of the superintendent. Um, it is brutal in terms of um, lots of places, but school-based hiring because our calendar is so set um, and the gearing up for the next year. And as it stands, there's very little incentive <laughs> for an employee to um, indicate early. And as a result, it's, it's pretty uncommon to happen. So it just messes you up in the hiring um, season uh, cycle. People uh, look for jobs in January and December, and a lot of times we're left hiring in June, July, and August. So, uh, so this will uh, go a, a very long way in our efforts to uh, just improve quality um, of the applicant pool that we have access to. I would, by the way, just want to make sure to um, clarify it's in my memo. I'm not sure I've repeated tonight. This would apply to teachers and administrators. We expect retirements in both areas. Seeing no further questions, uh, all in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion passes. Uh, next, we have a banking resolution motion. I don't know if that's you or uh, Miranda. The uh, right language here. I lost it. Yes. Um, that's just to update um, so that uh, the people currently holding the positions necessary to sign the checks can sign the checks. I'll go ahead and make the motion uh, that the motion to be the school board designates the following positions as authorized signers for the key bank depository account. Superintendent uh, Howard Smith, school board chair Patrick Halliday, school board uh, clerk Liz Curry, uh, director of finance Nathan Lavery, accounting manager Miranda McDonald. The school board removes Stephanie Phillips as an authorized signer for the key bank depository account. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Shumsky. Um, this is a my opinion, it's a, it's, a, it's a pro forma move that we need to do in order to pay our bills and draw on the account from KeyBank. Hearing no other comment, uh, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> motion passes. Um, here we go. I'm going I'm to ask uh, that we... Um, to, to change the, to amend the agenda just slightly and that we uh, take the uh, the tuition rate removal approval uh, which is 6e and move it to 6d and move the budget to uh, to 6d um, uh, I'm sorry to 6e uh, I think the tuition rate approval should be a quick discussion and I would prefer to get that done before we go into a budget discussion uh, yes no, that's I'm just I'm asking for a suspension of the rules unless there's someone who wants just to, to move that around um, Howard, Nathan, I'm not sure who we turn to for this. Nathan, you want to speak to that? Sure. So um, 
state law requires us to announce a tuition rate. Uh, we have to do it by January 15th, and the board needs to take action on that. So that's why it's before you tonight. The announced tuition rate is a maximum rate that we can charge. So um, as depending on the outcome of, of tonight's discussion and on the actual budgets, we can um, actually bill an amount that's below those amounts. But we, um, but we need to take action tonight if we want to be able to charge up to those amounts uh, this coming year. I'd entertain a motion if anyone would like to make one. Commissioner Kirk? I'll make a motion to approve this uh, agenda item to change the, um, to change the tuition rate. The tuition rates uh, yeah, as, as, as presented here. by Commissioner, or by uh, uh, Nathan. Second from, I didn't see, uh, Commissioner Truman. Uh, would you like to talk to it, uh, Commissioner Kirk? No, I have nothing to say. You okay. Just something we got to do. Uh, Commissioner Chino. <laughs> just a point, a point of process that I've gotten some feedback that there's people in the audience who can't hear our discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Matson. Um, yeah, I guess I have two questions. One would be, how has the? Do you know how the? Maximum rate has compared to what we've charged when we've had tuition students um, in the past. And how do these rates compare to the current school year's rates? So um, the first part of your question, I, I'm not sure I quite understood it. Could you just repeat I mean, that? this year we had a max. Well, actually, maybe go backwards. This year the maximums compared to these numbers, how? Oh, okay. So uh, in the cases of kindergarten, uh, grades 1, 6, and 7, 12, those are the same rates. On top is actually down uh, just slightly, and BTC is up somewhat. The, um, so, so that's how it compares to what we are, what we are currently charging. And um, I think in most cases, that's the rate that we actually build this year as opposed to uh, announcing and then coming in at a different billing level, although I don't have that information at my fingertips. Okay, thank you. How many students do we have, uh, do you know? You may not have that either, that who tuition in? I don't know the answer for all of the categories. We have I believe only one secondary, the regular education secondary student this year, and um, something like four or five uh, on top is um, what Lynn Kennedy uh, told me when I checked in with her. I can't remember the BTC number. It's obviously more than that, but um, we're not talking about all, a lot of money in those other categories in terms of uh, the, the tuition rate times the quantity. Thank you. Seeing no further question, or, uh, no further discussion. Uh, all in favor of uh, the motion to accept the tuition rates as uh, as proposed uh, by Nathan, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Motion passes. Um, and now discussion moving to uh, to the budget. And I, I just want to frame this discussion real quickly before. We, we get into it. Uh, first of all, just procedurally, I ask people to, to be succinct, uh, listen to each other, uh, make sure that you don't need to repeat something that someone else has said, or if you're going to repeat, repeat very, very briefly. Um, but, I, but, but I also want to uh, talk um, a little bit more philosophically uh, about the discussion itself. And uh, I know that there are a lot of people on the board, a lot of people in the community, um, parents, regular community members, teachers, um, and, and certainly the kids that this discussion is going to affect. And I've been, uh, I've been heartened by the discussion that the board has been engaged in. Uh, people come to it with different opinions. People come to it with, uh, with a, a different set of values, not that one val set of values is superior to another, but with different set of values. And, um, and at this point, everyone, I think, on the board, I, I hate to speak for everyone, but I think everyone on the board has already um, given some from what their ideal budget would look like. Um, and uh, you never get the budget that, uh, or you never get the programs that are ideal. And with that sense, I, I, I urge people to continue to listen to each other, um, be informed by each other's opinions, um, not necessarily to change your mind, but to, to, to give uh, a fair hearing to the discussion uh, before you uh, go any further and make your discu discussion. Um, with that, 
Uh, Commissioner Stoll. Okay. Um, thank you. So I'd like to make a motion as follows. Um, I don't know if you have the motion already in front of you. Okay, it's a little bit different than what you had, may have had in front of you. I make a motion to approve. Uh, whoops, 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 something is happening to my notes here. Okay, uh, here we go. I make a motion to approve a fiscal year 16 budget amount oh, that is. Oh. Sorry, Miriam. I don't think everybody does have the motion I can share. No, no, that, that's okay. I was actually just asking if the. Um, so I don't have You don't have it. it. Okay. I, I will read it out, Liz. Um, I can just share it with everybody on BSD. On there. On on docs, I made yeah. a few changes to it. Did you yeah, see, I see it? Yeah, I see that. Okay, okay, great. All right, so Liz will go ahead and change it. And as she's sharing it, I will read it out to the, to the public. Thank you. Motion to approve a fiscal year 16 budget amount that is 1.75% higher than the approved fiscal year 15 budget of 67,415,369 or 68,595,138 dollars to reflect the community's desire to assure that the Burlington School District offers a high quality education to all students. The amount shall not include additional monies to support STEM education at Flynn Elementary in fiscal 15, semicolon. Otherwise, this motion gives the superintendent the authority to adjust budget categories as necessary to accommodate new budget information that affects the district's ability to implement the proposed educational services and programs. Second. We have a motion on the, board, uh, on the table uh, from Commissioner Stoll. Seconded by Commissioner Curry. Commissioner Stoll, would you like to speak to the motion? I would. Um, there are different ways to approach the budget process. And when you're sitting uh, in our chair, it's difficult. Because we see it from, I guess, a slightly different view in that we have a lot of information from a lot of people. It keeps coming and it keeps coming. We have professionals to listen to. We have our own backgrounds to think about. Over the course um, of this budget process, we've become a bit polarized as a board between what we now call the 1.5 and the 2.0. And I think we all have our reasons for wanting one or the other. For those of you who don't know, I'm the chair of the Finance Committee, and at our last finance meeting, we put forth, we asked the superintendent to start from the 2.0 budget that he brought to us and to bring it down to 1.5, and he did that. Since then, there's been no discussion as a full board regarding where we want to go. So traditionally, the finance director, or the, the, fi the chair of the finance committee, would bring forth a motion that had some um, sort of solidity to it, <laughs> that there was some sense uh, that there was a majority of people who might support it. When I did my work today, I discovered that we were pretty much split right down the middle, seven to seven. And some of us have been working hard to try and find a place where we might be able to move to, that we could move forward so that we could have a budget to put forth to the voters, so that we could get, get on to the business of educating our children and moving a district forward. And that seemed like it wasn't going to happen. So I guess I've decided to put this budget forward at 1.75 more as a matter of practicality than of deep conviction. And I ask you to bear with me as I do that. It's not ideal. But I think it's a way that we may be able to present to the community our ideas as a board and to let them know we've done the best we can and that we're ready now to let the community give us their opinion through their vote. That's the reason for this particular motion that I'm putting forward. Now I want to take a minute and just describe my feelings, because I'm sure, as uh, Commissioner Dodson did a few minutes ago quite eloquently, all of us have reasons why we are supporting the two or the one or how we got to how we got. 1.5, sorry. I may be one of the few people in Burlington who's actually quite excited about this budget. I like it. I like the 1.5, and I like the 2. 
And I think I like the 1.752, and this is why. A year ago at this time, we had virtually no idea about what we were spending uh, as a district. We had a district that was fairly, um, was running amok financially. We didn't know where we were spending, but we knew we were spending too much. We had leaders who didn't have a grasp for how to plan financially. We had crisis after crisis, and we were basically backpedaling, trying to figure out what's going on here. A number of things then proceeded to change, and we as a board came together over time. In my mind, we didn't do it quick enough. We made some mistakes, but we've made some tremendous changes. And right now, we do have a sense of where we spend our money. We do have a sense of how we make our financial decisions. We do have an idea that there are actually good controls in place, more than an idea, in fact. We have good controls in place. And best of all, we have a leadership team that knows how to handle money and knows how to do this. And I think as a board, we should step back and acknowledge that we have come a long way. So at this point, what we have in front of us is a budget that isn't random. It's not based on cuts. It's a budget that was carefully thought out based on actually what things cost, not what we thought or they did last year or they might have cost. And it goes a step further. It actually makes the connection between finances and student achievement, finances and student need. And it's made some what I feel are really positive changes in the way we're going to be serving our children. I'm talking primarily about the realignment of the way some of the paraeducators and special education um, supports are going to be supplied. On the one hand, you could say that we're taking something away because we're going to have less total paraeducators. But if you look carefully, that's not what's happening at all. We are saying that we are going to provide more services, direct academic services, to help our most needy students. We're going to be re we're going to be taking our educators and we're going to be spreading them out more equitably among all the kids, not just certain kids who have certain labels, and that's a good thing. We're also going to be bringing into the field some excellent professionals, professionals, school psychologists, who do have specific training to do exactly the kind of work we need in our schools, people who understand the emotional needs of students and the academic needs of students and know how to combine those things and support and help teachers to do that. So from my standpoint, this is a good budget. And I'm happy that we're here. And again, would I be happy at 1.5? Yes. Would I be happy at 2? Yes. Am I happy at 1.75? Yes. And I don't want to spend time quibbling about whether we should have one more of this or one less of that. That's what we had to do last year when we had no idea about anything. And we would say, well, how about this? Well, this will cost this. Let's take off this. And what we learned is that doesn't work. So what I want to do now is accept, more or less as a whole, the proposal that's been put before us by Superintendent Smith and Finance Director Lavery, which, as I've said, is an excellent proposal. And I'd like us to get behind it as a board and support it. And I know that means some of you changing your opinions. I know that means some of you creeping up a little bit or creeping down a little bit. But I personally think it's the best thing for us as a board to move forward. It's the best thing for the community. And at base, it's the best thing for the kids, too. For those of you who think that this is too much, I would say it's not that different from 1.5. Together, we have talked about the fact that we can't do it all at once. We can't cut everything all at once. It's smarter to cut things carefully so you make the right decisions going forward. It was almost like um, Commissioner Shumsky, Shumsky a few minutes ago when he was talking about the STEM initiative. And he said, well, we don't just want to cut it now because it may not be where we want to go later. That could be applied to many aspects of our budget. So I ask you to just think about inching up just a little bit. For those of you that think that uh, 1.75 is not high enough. I ask you to think about the fact that we all need to make some sacrifices and changes. 
and that we are, in fact, talking about not too much money, that the fundamental framework of the plan that um, Dr. Smith has put forth does not get shaken or changed by taking a quarter of a percent out of it. The fundamental framework is the same. So I, with that, I would just ask you all to think about it. I come back each time to the notion that just because we've always done things the same, this particular way doesn't mean it's the best way to go. I think this is a budget that we can embrace with that in mind. We're not necessarily doing anything worse or less. We're doing it differently, smarter, more effective, and I think it will be good for the kids. Uh, Commissioner Sabrino, <coughs> Commissioner Porter. So I'm going to uh, hold off on comments, but I have two questions. First, I would like to ask that the motion be reread, mm -hmm. uh, and then I'd like to follow up with a second question. Motion to approve an FY16 budget amount that is 1.7% higher than the approved FY15 uh, budget of $67,415,369 or $68,500,000. Uh, $68 thank you. $68,595,138 to reflect the community's desire to assure that the Burlington School District offers a high quality education to all students. This amount shall not include additional monies to support STEM education at Flynn Elementary in FY15. Otherwise, this motion gives the superintendent the authority to adjust budget categories as necessary to accommodate new budget information that affects the district's ability to implement the proposed educational services and programs. Uh, I'd like to proceed with my next question. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, this is a question for Superintendent Smith and perhaps Finance Director Lavery. I'd like to refer you to the budget proposal from last week's meeting and uh, page nine of that proposal. Uh, at the and in particular to the deficit reduction plan. So I'm just going to kind of lay it out for the audience as well. Uh, many of you know that there was uh, there's a, a deficit anticipated this year and in one of the more forward-looking years we've had, the um, administrative team uh, became aware of that and implemented a deficit reduction plan that has three parts. Part of it is uh, to um, to uh, to slow down expenditures, a budget freeze with a, a, a process for people making requests for uh, funding for resources for the classroom. The second part is uh, deferred maintenance. There was, uh, so some savings will be obtained from deferred maintenance. That totals roughly $1.3 million, which is exactly the size of the projected deficit. So the administration last week proposed that in addition to that, uh, to hold in reserve the BED reimbursement of $748,000. I think it's a wise plan. I appreciate you doing it. Uh, but I, what I'd like to ask is, what is, your, expect, what is your, your assessment of the probability that there will be any funds left over from the BED money to be applied next year? And I would actually like to ask you, uh, I, I, you know, we live in a world of uncertainty and probability, but I'm going to ask you to assign a probability to the possibility that at least half of those BED funds will be able to be carried over next year, which could then bridge the gap between the 1.5 and 2% budget. We've been talking about um, the different ways to approach the, the best use of the, of the revenue available. The BED money, um, it, it turns out that um, whatever we don't apply this year, we received the money this year. We have authority to apply it this year. Whatever we don't apply this year is, uh, has to be audited next year and is not available to us next year. Um, the audited amount, um, whatever that balance is, then becomes available as revenue in the following year, FY17. Our goal would, uh, to, would be to, um, uh, you know, use this money judiciously this year. The one, um, I think, important consideration in thinking about using these funds has to do with remi remembering that all of the savings we're talking about that we um, drew from uh, basically out of what would otherwise have been next year's budget um, have to do with changes that won't take place until next year. So the problem we face is we face all of the um, baked in, you know, potential for over expenditure this year, and we can't apply any of the savings 
that we propose for next year. We're not going to lay off people in January, you know, for the remainder of the year. We're, you know, so that we're, we're kind of stuck with that sort of reality of having to deal with making up for um, these, you know, these funds and how much of that are for the over expenditures and how much do you try to extract out of a budget when you can't use the very savings that you're planning to use um, because they won't be available to us until next year. So if you, if you play that out, for example, it probably puts a strong, it'll put stronger pressure on using the BED money to say, look, it's, it's, it's one-time money. We have a one-time need to um, readjust our budget to essentially true it up to what it really should have been this year, so do it. Uh, and then if you're fortunate enough to have some revenue, that's great. Um, don't count on it for FY16, though. It becomes available in FY17. Thanks. I'd, I'd be reluctant to put a percentage figure on a, a probability on that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any further comment? Commissioner Seguino? Uh, not yet. Later. <laughs> Commissioner Porter? Thank you. The, um, I'm going to read something in a second, but I think it's really important that everybody understand that um, I just have absolutely the utmost respect for every single member on this board. Um, let's not make this out to be uh, this big divisive chasm that sits between us. It doesn't. So let's just shoot that down right now. It's not there. What's here is people just differing on how to get to some solutions. And we have some things that we know are coming in the future that are great, great concern to all of us. Okay, so let's understand that, you know, Liz is a very persuasive person, and I respect every single word that comes out of her mouth. Kat's very persuasive. Scott, Dr. Smith, right, right down the line. Every single person here has a value that they bring to this board, and every single person here makes you think. And we don't always agree. I think we've had the most unanimous motions, uh, resolutions in this meeting that I've sat through since last year. Uh, usually the only unanimous motion that we have is uh, we're ready to adjourn. Um, but that shows that we have, you know, we, we have differing populations. We represent different wards. Um, we have different people talking to us. So just so you know, this, this, there's no chasm here. There's, there's nothing that's insurmountable. Um, there is, um, we're, there's, no gonna, there's not going to be any backslapping on, on whatever the number comes out to. Uh, because none of us are happy with this. This is not where we wanted to go. We're having to make up for some issues that we've had in the past and that we face in the future. All right? So if you'd just allow me to just uh, to read this. Um, it's important that a number of the members on the school board make clear our support for the 1.5% expenditure increase and subsequent 2.2% tax increase. We do not yet know how we got to the point of last year's budget deficit and the preceding 10 years deficit totaling $12.5 million. We must accept that we may never know the whole truth about the cause of prior year's deficits and record increases in spending because financial records are just of such poor quality. Moreover, we have too little information to know with accuracy what the fiscal year 16 budget should be. We know Financial Director Lavery will put in place the controls around proper budget and expense management. We know the community has a lack of trust in the school finances and they come by that honestly. We know the children can't wait while the community gets its act together and delivers the changes and improvements necessary for every child to graduate high school and be productive and happy adults in our community. Most prominently, we know we face within the next few years a minimum bill of over $40 million to replace our aging high school that is cold and dangerous to our children. Your school board is acting as prudent adults, planning for the future, and reeling in expenses as much as you would do in favor for your kids' college education. No parent would simply say, we'll face tuition costs when they happen. They live within the means of a household to secure their children's future, and the school board is doing just that. As reported by Ed Gomo, our financial advisor we hired last year to assist the business office, the school board and district have spent millions that this community never authorized. The annual deficit was simply recognized as a new starting point for the upcoming year. And yet the school board is 100% responsible to ensure controls are in place to identify new needs and deal with them through analysis of priorities. The board has been entrusted by the voters to rebuild the faith that their dollars are being wisely spent and as the community sees fit. We are obligated to make tough choices in order to lead the district down the path of this community, again acting as one as we improve educational outcomes, plan and develop programs for success for the children, 
and ultimately create greater opportunities for all students to live here as adults in safety and happiness. Since last year, most of the board has publicly stated support for a 0% budget for the 2015-2016 uh, uh, budget year. Due to the hard work in, of Dr. Smith and Nate Lavery, we now better understand the pressures and potential gains that further investigations will lead to. We know, though, that a 0% budget applied in a single year would cut programs too radically. To permit the proper community involvement, we as a board support. It is with hesitation but understanding that many will concede to the 1.5% increase. Contrary to disinformation being passed around, the 0.5% reduction to the 2 against the 2% does not further increase class size. It does not eliminate social worker positions. It has nothing to do with the elimination of bus subsidies. And it does not touch the successful magnet schools. These rumors and conjecture have to stop. As reported in the Burlington Free Press yesterday, top leaders in the Vermont legislature made clear it may take a year simply to translate the rhetoric of education funding reform. And per Shap Smith, the House Speaker, it may take two years to deliver tax relief. This city cannot wait. Our children cannot wait. There will be no knight in shining armor coming to our help. We must do this ourselves. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a list going here. It, uh, next was uh, Commissioner Truman. I, I expect I'll have comment later, but I'm wondering, do we have um, estimated tax figures for this proposal, well, how this impacts uh, relative to uh, the 2% or the 1.5 that was being discussed uh, last week? I did some quick calculations, and um, it looks like the tax impact um, would be somewhere, not surprisingly, in between probably around 2.35 to 2.5% um, percent. the range I provide there is just because um, we would have to consider if there would be any revenue impact um, on the revenue side but we're probably it's probably safe to assume it would be you know around 2.4% which would uh, in to what per hundred thousand dollars of assessed value um, I didn't work those up, but I can do that in a moment. Okay. Thank you. Anything further, Commissioner Truman? Not right now. Right. Commissioner Curry? Um, thank you. Um, again, first I just have to thank everybody that's engaged in this process, um, especially all the staff and the community members who have come to meeting after meeting to follow what's going on. Um, we've experienced a lot of turmoil thinking about the impact of this budget, and at this time the impact is unknown, but the fear is understandable. For some, the reductions feel like invasive surgery that may or may not um, result in more damage than heal healing. For others, it feels like the diet that will prevent a heart attack. There's general agreement that we have an unhealthy budget due to bloat. My feeling is that those who are most familiar with the budget numbers have indicated their lack of confidence in the most austere budget choice. <clears throat> I ran for this elected body because of my concerns about past budge budgeting and spending practices. After only 18 months on the board, I've watched the students, parents, teachers, and staff experience tremendous uncertainty and pressures and make efforts to change their habits, practices, and standards to adapt to the new budget environment. This budget asks the community to adjust to yet another set of standards without understanding the impact. My observation is that the community has responded reluctantly on all sides with divergent opinions about the two options. It has been hard in some cases to find common ground, but this resolution encourages me that there ultimately can be common ground. I am grateful that during this very tense and uncomfortable time, underneath it all, there has been great care and consideration given to all members of our community to the greatest extent possible by all the board members. On a personal level, I had a hard time even going to this point of 1.75. As a student of the Pittsburgh Public Schools in the 1970s, I had problems with drugs and truancy, and there were no social workers to help me. My own child benefited tremendously from a literacy coach in elementary school, and even though I applaud the reorganization of special education and social works, 
services, I'm worried for our most vulnerable students who face all of the pressures. The 1.75% solution allowed me to feel comfortable enough that we would not lose too much ground. I appreciate Commissioner Stoll for her leadership on this and I support this resolution. Commissioner Matson. Yeah, I just have a, I have a question which is somewhere, and I guess it's probably for the maker of the motion and maybe the second. Um, there was a discussion about not getting into sort of well, let's try taking rid of this and saving this amount of money and this, that, the other, and not wanting to do that here, and yet the motion has one very specific item mentioned. Is there a reason why that item is mentioned and not left to the discretion of the superintendent like everything else? Please. Um, yeah. Um, as in my position of talking to many people about where they stood on, on the budget, and also in my work on the board in the last two years as the curriculum on the curriculum committee and policy committee before this um, I really got the sense from every board member that I spoke with and perhaps perhaps that's not true that there was um, coalescing around the feeling that the board had on two occasions uh, committees of the board had made the determination already not to go forward investing in stem until that decision had been brought forth on more of a policy level for the board. So I was hearing that from everybody and felt comfortable that that was um, not exactly a budget issue but more a policy issue at this point. So that was my thinking in, in putting it in, that it was felt that um, prior to Dr. Smith coming on board, there were several discussions where that clearly, that question was more or less answered. Again, I would um, underscore what Commissioner Shumsey said earlier, I do not think this at all says anything about not wanting to explore STEM. It just simply says at this point, we haven't made the decision to go forward. So that's why it's there. The point of information. It's just a question, if it's, it's, if it's out of order, let me know. Procedurally, is the motion that we are passing today, is that need to be the motion that will be on the ballot? <coughs> That's a very good oh, point. Yeah, if that's the case, um, yeah. yeah, I'm asking that because they then this becomes out some of the language that yes. may or may not be appropriate. But somehow we would need to identify, you know, the legislative intent of this body. Okay, for no, what I, you're I was not aware. I don't of that. know that. I'm answer. sorry. So I did not make it with that intent. So I would be open in, if we need to rework the language in some way to make that uh, work. But perhaps we could have the discussion on the content of it yeah. first. Yeah. Thank you, I have a suggestion on the language, but uh, Commissioner Matson, did you have anything? Uh, yeah, um, I'm not going to say much more tonight, but I just want to make a point to that, which it was basically said, if I understood you correct, Miriam, that this is basically a policy or something like that decision that you attached to this finance motion. Mm -hmm. um, I have a hard time with things like that, um, you know, and I think that doing that also, um, you know, I could look to put other things in here as well, and I just, um, it, it makes me uncomfortable, and I'm sitting here really thinking I should be making a motion to remove that language, um, but it's going to be a long night, and I would like to actually hear what we, we may need to amend the language anyway right now. So I'm going to wait on that. Commissioner Giannone. Um, okay, actually, so a question that I have is um, in, the, in the 2% budget, I'm curious why the superintendent put that STEM funding in in the first place. <clears throat> when I did my uh, original uh, budget presentation, I tried to speak to this a little bit, um, but a, a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, I think it, uh, it starts with reinforcing the notion that this um, budget exercise t was not something that was driven by simply a mandate to cut. Um, in fact, that was um, not um, the driving um, consideration in the work that we did. Um, we we tried to we understood that there were constraints and we understood that there would 
<clears throat> any budget that added up to a, a significant increase would be called into question given the economic circumstances and what the district has been through. But we tried to look at um, you know, building a budget based on looking at, at standards and needs of students. And, and we, um, I didn't know what the actual increase would be until the weekend before um, we presented budget to the Finance Committee. Um, and so uh, it turned out that it came out at, at 2 percent. That said, um, in the course of constructing a budget and looking at interests and needs, uh, a particular area uh, came to my attention and um, my, um, in going through the schools and talking with people, uh, and that had to do with what, first of all, I was very impressed with uh, what it, uh, has been accomplished in the other magnet schools. Um, but then, you know, I uh, came to appreciate that there was, uh, and as you've heard reinforced um, in comments uh, tonight as well, um, a real readiness to take the next step. And my understanding was that some work had been done at least to identify that this would have, uh, would, was a strong, um, there was strong interest around this area as a next step. So I felt that it was also a relatively modest um, amount to put in the, uh, as a budget increase, about twenty-six, twenty-seven thousand uh, dollars in terms of particularly related to what you could accomplish uh, by investing that money and leveraging it. Uh, and so it was important to me to, to make sure that people understand that if we just allow ourselves to get overwhelmed by uh, all of the, um, the things that sort of drag the budget downward and take us in a direction of, of cut this, reduce that, um, when do you ever get to the point of saying we'd ever do anything new or different? And I just felt that it was important for, for this budget to have something. Now, it could have been something else, but, but frankly, anything that would have cost a lot of money really would have been kind of a non-starter. This was an opportunity to take an issue that um, really did not in involve a huge outlay um, and capture an energy and a readiness and an enthusiasm and excitement that already exists uh, in ways that are true to the spirit of um, what I think the district tried to, has tried to accomplish um, in other ways through the other magnet schools. It is an investment in equity. Um, it is an investment in the future. I referenced at the time I proposed this that um, it, was, it saddened me to go through Burlington um, Tech and see uh, the engineering class closed down for lack of interest on the part of students to, um, enrolling in the program. So it, it just seemed to me a lot of factors came together that spoke to me, and I didn't pluck this out of thin air, uh, and it seemed important to at least put it forward and give people an opportunity to think forward, think about actually growing something, creating something, building on a level of excitement, enthusiasm that exists uh, as, as we do this other hard, admittedly hard work. Can I ask another question? You may. So uh, there's a motion on the floor for a 1.75. Now, I was previously going to support the 2% 2, 2 and one of the major reasons I was going to do that is because that was what was recommended by the superintendent's office and the chief financial officer's office. So could those two gentlemen give me an idea of how they feel about the 1.75, please? Uh, Nate, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll say a few things and then uh, from, from the, and then I'll ask uh, um, Nathan to speak to any of the, just from the, the fiscal uh, end of things. Um, I, I think it's important for, for people to appreciate that um, any position we take is not based on this is um, a sense of, this is like, my proposal and any sense of sort of or our proposal and, and kind of a clinging to it for those reasons. Uh, first of all, um, we did a lot of work with, uh, with a lot of people to generate the proposal and it's very important, particularly when you're in an interim role, um, for it not in fact to be just the interim's proposal uh, to leave to everyone else to uh, figure out how to, how to deal with it. Um, it's important for people to own and embrace some of the work and the changes that are reflected in it. And, um, while some of it was come to, um, certainly people came to it reluctantly, some of the other work that we're talking about, particularly the reallocation of resources, uh, has been embraced uh, quite enthusiastically. So I, I think that uh, you know, on balance, there are a lot of factors that went into to the 2%. The reason that we've expressed concern at primarily uh, uh, on the 1.5 
had to do with the, the ongoing uncertainties that we um, continue to deal with and a concern that um, we had to be very cautious about trying to do too much too fast in achieving savings. And while there were, it was still, uh, the landscape was kind of shifting underneath our feet, we needed to um, provide at least some modest level of breathing room that would keep options open uh, for all of us as we look ahead to, to really achieve our primary goal, which is um, you know, a balanced budget and not put ourselves in any situation where surprises could cast that um, into um, doubt next year. 1.75, I think, is um, when, you're, when you're looking at it in terms of how to get people with differing views to some middle ground uh, on, that, on that level, I think um, it makes a lot of sense if, in fact, it can be a rallying point for the board and people can um, feel that they, it, they can kind of form a consensus around that figure. I can tell you we, will, we would make that work, um, and it would certainly be, give us a little bit more confidence than the 1.5 in terms of our capacity and make sure that we don't run into problems with just the basic task of balancing the budget. Uh, and uh, to me, if, if uh, a lot of this now has to do with um, the board and being able to project to the community as much as possible, uh, some, you know, uh, a point of being able to support um, where we are going forward with this budget. If 1.75 does that, from my perspective, we could make it work. Nathan, I don't know if you want to add any more, just sort of from the, you know, your, your uh, seat. I appreciate being asked, but I would just echo the superintendent's comments. Thanks. I've trained him well. <laughs> <laughs> Further comment? Uh, Commissioner Seguino? Actually, I'm going I'm to hold on. Uh, Commissioner Seguino and Commissioner Truman have each had a chance to, to comment or ask a question. Is there anyone else on the board who has not yet spoken who would like to have a, a chance to uh, make a, a first comment? The floor is yours, Commissioner Seguino. Thanks. My fellow commissioners were uh, smart enough to have a prepared statement. I don't, but uh, I'll do the best I can. Um, uh, so I'm going to speak to the, both the 1.75 and the 1.5 percent budget. The difference between them is roughly $180,000. It's not a significant difference, but there are some philosophical issues uh, and broader contextual issues that I think are informing our positions. Um, I want to say generally, whether it is the 1.5 or the 1.75 budget, that what we are observing in this budget is not a continuation of the financial mismanagement of the district that we've observed over the past 10 years, nor is it the end of quality education in Burlington as we know it. Uh, I sense a great deal of anxiety on all sides about this, and I come from a ward in which there are very disparate views on this, and so it makes my position particularly difficult, but as an elected uh, official, I also have to uh, vote on this and deliberate on this based on utilizing my experience and intelligence and understanding of that. Um, so I, I want to just affirm that we are not on a knife's edge. It may feel like we're on a knife's edge, that we, uh, we risk falling into financial ruin or that we risk the, uh, the destruction of quality education in Burlington. What I will say is what has happened in the last few weeks is that uh, what you are observing is this district moving judiciously and cautiously forward with a determination and a clear vision that we want an inclusive school district. Uh, so in my view, the, last, uh, the work of the last six weeks has been uh, a step forward. We've had a very healthy and informed debate uh, based uh, on the, uh, the best ability of the district to provide information, and that information was um, faulty coming in, so the work has been, uh, that has been impressive. Um, uh, and I, I want to say something ab about the budget in terms of what my values are <clears throat> in general before I talk about where I might vote on this. First of all, I think that as, as an economist and as a person whose son went to Burlington schools, that education is an investment with the payback in the future, that we can't think of it as just discretionary spending today. So I am well aware of the benefits of spending today that will actually result in reduced cost for our community in the future because we have a skilled, well-educated, and engaged student body. I also believe that, uh, that one of the things that Burlington Schools is missing and that I would deeply like to see is foreign language fluency starting in kindergarten. 
Uh, we don't have, a, a, we, we are not yet in a position to do that. I also believe that the district deeply needs to modernize its behavioral regulation system to support students. There's been a great deal of research on, uh, on trauma-informed therapy and behavioral <coughs> management, and in many ways our district really needs to move forward to ensure that our kids spend more time in the classroom and that we can reduce dropout rates in our school district, which are high for a number of <coughs> groups. For example, for students with disabilities, the dropout rate is 26%. For kids on free and reduced lunch, it is 18%. The boys in our district drop out at a rate of 15%. Those are all things that I would like to see us commit resources to, to addressing. I'd also like to see kindergarten teachers have the support and training that they need, uh, and I'd like to see uh, sufficient paraeducators, librarians, guidance counselors, and a diversity in guidance counselors, which we don't yet have. Uh, that said, I also believe that in order for us to uh, have these things in the community, not just this year, but in coming years, we cannot be a divided community. And so I, one of my concerns in this debate, and I have been an advocate for the 1.5% budget, is that we have to move judiciously forward and bring the whole community with us. That we cannot force a budget down the throats of those who are not yet with us and do not yet have the trust in the community, uh, the school district. One of my biggest concerns, and one of the things that I, I campaign, or that I, I was interested in serving on the school district for, is that that we need an evidence-based approach to making decisions. We say that, for example, uh, certain services will promote equity, they will, uh, that, that athletics keep kids engaged and so on and so forth. The reality is that this district does not produce the data that allows us to make good decisions with our money. I am really confident that as a board that many of the board members, and I'm hoping, and I'm hoping that Superintendent Smith will also agree with this, that we need to look at, we need to have a plan to evaluate the impact of whatever the changes are in this budget, budget to see if in fact what we are, are hoping for in terms of educational outcomes for our kids uh, actually materialize. And if they don't, to have the courage to change programs in coming years and to change funding and so forth. I believe that in this community, despite the burden of dramatic tax increases over the last several years in the face of wage stagnation. If we could make the case to our community that we in fact were serving our kids well and that they were leaving with, with the skills that they need, that the dropout rate was reduced to zero or even 5%, that we would have the support of the community. But we can't, we, can't, we can't bank on the trust that has been eroded over the last 10 years. And so while it is disappointing for some, I think that we do have to move forward um, <clears throat> very carefully. I wanna just say that uh, I, I had anticipated advancing this as a motion and I'm gonna decide not to do that, but I'd like to say it for myself that I personally, as a board member, have a commitment to an equitable and adequate provision of social and emotional services for the district's children. And I would like to ask the superintendent to prioritize funding such services. I agree with the comment that was made that we risk moving too quickly to school psychologists. Uh, it will take time to hire them and we don't have a bridge in that, in that period of time. Uh, school, social workers keep our kids in school and many of our kids face stress. So with that, let me just end with that and just say that I don't know where I'm gonna vote on this budget. I think the difference is actually uh, minute, but I personally think that we have an obligation to respect uh, the, the, uh, the need for unity in our community. I've studied a lot of countries and I've lived in countries with dictatorships and I know what happens when communities become divided. <clears throat> Uh, if you look at, for example, Greece right now, in which there is extreme economic distress, what you see is, although we might want humans to unite in periods of stress, in fact, often what they do is cannibalize each other. And so in, re in Greece, for example, what you see is a, an extraordinary increase in xenophobia and in particularly racial and ethnic attacks on immigrants. I'm not suggesting that we're close to that, but I'm just suggesting that, that, that we are in a good place in this community and it's important for us to move forward together and to think about the needs of the whole community. Our kids are fundamentally important, but we also have to be cognizant of everybody else in the community who has concerns about mismanagement that has occurred in the last 10 years. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Truman, uh, although before, uh, um, 
Nathan, you had some numbers <coughs> for us. The question was asked uh, what the, I believe what the 1.75% scenario would translate into in terms of the actual homestead rate. Um, so I just did the, the math on that. It looks like it would be about uh, $1.67.4 cents per $100 of assessed value. Just for comparison, because um, folks may not have it in front of them, the 2% uh, spending scenario translates to $1.67.9 cents. Then the 1.75 scenario, $1.67.4 cents. And the 1.5% scenario, $1.67.2 cents. Those are obviously estimated numbers. I'll just throw out the caveat again that some of these variables are uh, subject to change or revision by the state legislature. So, um, but that's what we have right now. Can I ask for just a, a quick clarification? So the, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the 1.5 number that you gave, $1.67.2. Um, my math says that that's uh, $1,672 per $100,000 of assessed value. Right. Right. So it'd be the 1.75 would be $2 more per $100 of assessed value. The 2% the would be $7 more than that per $100,000 of assessed value. I think that's right. Trying to follow you in my head there, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I hate yep, no, that's okay. Like I'm that. just, uh, what you'd get is per 100,000, I actually did it for the $250,000 scenario, it's fine. so. It's fine. <laughs> Do you have the $250,000 numbers? I think it would be. Yep, um, the, and yeah, so for comparison at that one, which I've already done um, from the previous presentation, it showed that the difference between the 2% and the 1.5% scenario was about $18, and the difference between the 2% and the 1.75% turns out to be um, about $12. Commissioner Truman. Thank you for that, Nathan. I appreciate that. I'm with Stephanie. I didn't prepare a speech. I jotted down various notes, so if I'm not looking you in the eye, that's why I'm just trying to find out where I put a few of the notes down. I did want to say a couple of things in the sitting in the, the odd position of only having served on the board for a couple of terms of being one of the more senior members. Um, I think perhaps after Commissioner Matson, I'm not sure, um, that no matter how this ends up and the whole conversations and everything, the discussions we've had uh, since the last March election, that I know that there is not a board member here or on past boards and some of the members here today who don't have the best interest of the kids at heart. Any of the discussion and any anger, heated things, or looking at each other funny is not a reflection on our commitment to the kids. And I think that's the piece that keeps grounding us, and that's coming through in what other folks here have been saying and has been kind of my anchor as we have these discussions. Um, like Commissioner Seguino, I'm not sure how I'm coming down on this current proposal. I do get a little hung up on the fact that the, the opportunity cost for not investing that extra $12 is greater than the impact it has on me as a taxpayer personally. So I'm, not comf uh, I'm comfortable with the 2%. Um, I'm not comfortable with 1.5. I'm slightly less uncomfortable with 1.75. And I'm continuing to give that some thought. Um, it was tempting for me to come up with an analogy that you know any kind of budget uh, budgeting in a financial time like we have now is like changing the tires on the school bus while it's going down the road. The, the whole school bus thing is probably a bad way to go on this one. Um, so, well, I was going to say this morning, but I'm not sure because it was a red-eye flight I just took back. But it was either this morning or yesterday I was in Portland, Oregon, uh, where my brother lives outside of town, and they drive 25 minutes to take their kids to uh, different schools. They have school choice there. Um, really because, and both of them are teachers, uh, public school, uh, one's a public school teacher, the other a uh, uh, college librarian, 
because their district provides a minimalist, non-innovative approach to teaching. They know their stuff. They know what a good quality education looks like, and they can't get that where they live. Their community does not invest in the schools. It provides the basic education they can for the kids, and it's just not 21st education. The children in that district are not coming out with that leg up that they need. There's not a sense of vision that I really feel that we have here in Burlington, whether with Partnership for Change or just the policy we have in place and that we have been building on for the past several years. That's not the same as the financial difficulties and problems that we have encountered and that we're dealing with and digging out and will be dealing with for some years to come. The commitment and the vision for what education in Burlington should be is solidly here, and I don't want to sacrifice that. I don't want us to make the mistake of, while we're getting on our, ho our house in order, that if we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, eh, maybe the water's getting a little too cold. Um, there's a nominal difference in the tax bill in that kind of investment, investment that we should be making, and it's something I really hope that we're all thinking about as we're trying to come to compromise. It should not necessarily be compromised. For the sake of compromise, maybe it could be compromise-ish. Um, you know, I think we are, it's been important to me and in the discussions we've had in the last few years, and as uh, Commissioner Seguino said and Commissioner Matson has said in the past, you know, embedding into our system uh, a data-informed decision-making process is really critical to us. And we didn't have that. We, were, we knew we were needing to move in that direction, and we weren't doing that quickly. I really think we're establishing that. I really think, and it's important to me that the, uh, at least that are expressed to the community, and don't worry, I'm not going to go on forever, um, that, you know, if this is like a train track, we've flipped the switch. We are on the track that the, that the voters said we need to be on. When the budget didn't pass the first time, there was some very loud and clear messaging going on, and we took that to heart. We have new members. A lot of people committed to it. We all did it. We've changed the direction that this, that this district functions in while still being committed to the vision that we went into it with. And there's no going back to that. And I think we will work out the problems over time. I don't have fear that we're going to regress. And I think that's an important message for the taxpayers, to have that kind of confidence that when you're demanding accountability and transparency and better financial management, we are doing that and are on that road. It's beyond just a commitment to it. It's actually happening. And that makes me comfortable with asking for a 2% instead of a 1.5. And, and again, the 175 will think about that. Um, in terms of general policy and addressing what uh, uh, Commissioners uh, Stoll and Curry were talking about in the original proposal about STEM or any other issues, you know, it made me uncomfortable setting things out like that in detail. I think that's a part of the discussion we should have with the board as legislative intent. You know, I'm not comfortable with cutting back physical education in the middle school. I've talked to members about my concerns about, um, you know, not being elegant in how they're handling the healthy living. I understand things like that are happening. So we would need to be able to make sure that we're having a process for expressing that and setting the intent of the board on these issues without necessarily having to put that down as a part of the proposal. But I understand in the end, we, we won't be having that in the final version. Um, but I will ask as an individual member, if it's not already being addressed, to, uh, you know, for the district, my personal opinion is I don't want to be rolling back the phys ed in um, middle school. It's also important to me that, that the district has a process for decision making in the schools. You know, when uh, the principal at BHS is deciding how to figure out the internal budget on that, that there is a process that ensures there are no surprises for the community and for families and parents for how the savings and adjustments are being arrived at and for input for families and the public to the extent practicable that could be taken into account. So that if we are, you know, hearing about changes that may be happening in, in a given program um, that may impact what teachers are or are not there or how, mu how the time is being allocated, that there is some kind of a public process within the time frame available, that that could be known and knowable. Uh, without people having to go and ask. And I ask uh, the superintendent to please see if that can be encouraged. Um, thank you very much.
Commissioner Shumsky. I'd like to make a motion. Um, uh, I'd like to um, make a motion to amend um, Commissioner Stoll's motion uh, to change it to approval of school budget for fiscal year 2016. Shall the voters approve the school department's proposed uh, $68,426,600 budget for education spending for fiscal year 2016 for current expenses and deficit retirement? And that would be a 1.5% increase. That's what it translates to. Did you just read that? Could it, Scott, could you say, I'm sorry, I kind of got lost in exactly with the change. So, so I think we, I think yeah. we did two, we like did two different things here. Once we, 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 you changed the language for, which would be something right that would be akin to would be on the ballot. But yep. I think the number was kind of. Uh, yep, sure, it's 68,426,600. I'm sorry, could you say that number again? Sixty-eight million four hundred twenty-six thousand six hundred dollars. Put the motion or the motion to amend on um, Liz's document that she sent to everyone. <clears throat> Commissioner Stoll, well, uh, we would need a second for any uh, for any did, amendment. Did you say one point five percent? Yes. Second, okay, Commissioner Stoll. Okay, a, a point of order. Are we um, doing, are you asking this as a friendly amendment? Sure. Okay, and are we, pl are we doing friendly amendments the way we've always done them? Is there some controversy? I, I know, that, I know yeah. that there has been some controversy. Okay, we're going to go ahead and do it the way yes. we've done it before. So yeah. I have the option now to accept or accept dismiss it. Accept right it. Okay, so I don't accept that as a friendly amendment. Okay. Yep. Any, further, any further comment on, uh, on the budget? I'm, oh, I'm sorry, were you still... But I was just trying to clarify to make sure I'm understanding. So what you're proposing is the it, it, it does. figure based on the 1.5? Yes. Is to move That's it to 1.5, yes. Okay, thank you. So, so you just changed no, the but, no, 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 there I did no not change. accept it. I'm so confused with them. What, did he, what is 1.5%? It, okay. I've got, so there was, a, there was a friendly amendment to change the dollar figure from the 1.75% increase that Commissioner Stoll had to a 1.5%. Uh, increase it was not accepted as friendly so we still have the oh, original that's what amendment I okay I thought you accepted so it. we still have okay. what's that Patrick I'm sorry so what was your last it wasn't accepted as a friendly so now we're gonna discuss it as as a hostile so we well or is as that an what an it's amendment. called a hostile <laughs> as an <laughs> it's appropriate, <laughs> it's appropriate. <laughs> As, as, uh, as an amendment so we could discuss on this would you like to speak to a commissioner Sumsky? <coughs> the just, yeah David Second in. Yeah, we have, we have a second from Commissioner Kirk. Thank you. Even though, Commissioner Seguino, you weren't prepared, it was very passionate and eloquent, so unfortunately you put us to shame, the rest of us who prepared. Um, I want to thank the compromises that have been made thus far for commissioners such as Commissioner Porter, who reluctantly agreed to compromise from 0 to 1.5%, for Commissioner Curry to compromise from 2 to 1 and 3 quarter percent. I want to thank and commend the staff of the Burlington School District for putting forth the most reasonable, responsible budget seen in many years. I grew up here. I went to C.P. Smith, Lyman Hunt, and BHS, and I, I keep asking people around town, I was like, I, I never remember an increase in the budget under two, I never see, remember seeing a one in an increase. I just, I would love to have that information to know. I don't know if you'd break the computer if you try to go that far back. Um, and that, you know, tying our budget increase to the rate of inflation and the rate of income growth, that's what really matters. When folks in our community are seeing no raises or raises of 1% or worse, losing their jobs, they can't sustain educational budget increases like we've seen here in Burlington. The figures from the GOMO report bear repeating. The financial consultant who worked for the district over the summer and autumn to help us to better help us understand our financial problems spending in the Burlington School District has risen 64 percent over the past seven years while inflation as measured by the Northeast Consumer Price, Price Index only increased 10 percent during that same time frame while student enrollment remained relatively flat that is shocking that is unsustainable 
For delivering a two budget, a two percent budget increase, I thank the staff of the Burlington School District for working incredibly hard and diligently with Dr. Smith. I also want to thank the administration for their budget presentation, which they gave last week, which I believe purposefully begins with the focus on where it should be, educational outcomes, and more precisely, where we are failing too many in our community. If you remember, Dr. Smith's presentation is right there on page three. We're, we're talking about how we're not serving all students. We hear too often we have the best education in the state, and I think we do. But the reality is not every one of our students has access to that best education and is not benefiting from that best education. And I think Dr. Smith's numbers bear that out. It means we need to change how we do things. You know, starting with my campaign for school commissioner and continuing with my work on the curriculum committee with commissioners Dotson and China, the only issue more concerning to me than our financial issues are the educational outcomes for our students. I talked about the statistics in Dr. Smith's budget presentation, but they're not statistics. These are real lives. These are the kids in the district whose lives, when, when you see that they're not at proficiency, we failed them. We failed them as board members, we failed them as an educational system, and we failed them as a community. And it's not, it's not like you work for a private company and you, you didn't hit your numbers this week so you don't get a sales bonus. It's like, this is a kid's life who might never be the same when we don't make sure that the proficiency is there for every, every student in our, in our community. On page seven of Ed Gomo's report, he recommended moving to outcome-based management when building budgets. We do not do this now, we need to for our students. I know Commissioner Seguino touched on this, and you know, to Dr. Smith's credit is that he, he's trying to do as much as he can since being on the job two months. Um, but I think given the time, if, if this was his third year in office, is that in his position that Dr. Smith would be talking about where the funds are going and how they're justified because we're looking at outcomes. Last week, when we witnessed the budget presentation, the district talked about how we're going to try to avert yet another fiscal year with a million dollar plus deficit. Does this sound familiar? It should. Over the past decade, deficits have been the norm, not the exception. Twelve million in unimproved expenditures over the past decade. Last spring, there was little thought and no creativity involved in budget proposals presented to the board by the administration. Cuts were done in an isolated fashion. This year we have a budget presentation that talks of programmatic changes driven by logic. While we may not all agree with these programmatic proposals, there is a macro logic behind them. Since joining the board last April, I have approached most school financial matters with skepticism. During the board's come to Jesus moment last spring, we as a board pledged to put in the fiscal controls to prevent such poor financial practices from continuing and asking the community to approve a budget in June that was higher than the budget that was rejected in March, the argument was we know we overspent yet again what our community authorized at the ballot box, but we promise we aren't going to do it anymore, and this time we really mean it. But here we are again. With that said, this skeptic is starting to believe. Since December's Finance Committee meeting, I've thought long and hard of Commissioner Porter's request for a 0% budget increase, the administration's proposal for 2%, and the Finance Committee's request for a proposal to match the Northeast CPI at 1.5%, not knowing which position or positions I'd be willing to support. Dr. Smith and Finance Director Lavery have been strong senior staff partners that this board has sought and this community deserves. Through personal conversations, I know there are many hardworking staff members in the Burlington School District who have been frustrated and stifled by previous administrations who govern top down. <clears throat> to have a staff leader like Dr. Smith, who is not only enlisting the 1,500 staff members to aid him in building our budget, but counting on them to rethink and recreate our budget and education delivery model is inspiring. It's hopeful. Unfortunately, Dr. Smith will be leaving his position in roughly 180 days. We have this man for less than half a year. The budget we are voting on tonight will be implemented and managed not by Dr. Smith, but by our next permanent superintendent. And while Finance Director Lavery will still function in his position, hopefully, as mentioned previously, we have previously employed staff leaders in our district who have stifled staff members when it is their prerogative. This is the dilemma we face. We are entrusting a presently unknown individual with $68 million in the hopes they will be more like Dr. Smith and less like some of our st less than stellar leaders of the past. 
For this reason, I cannot support any increase in the FY16 budget above 1.5%. As a member of a 14-member board charged with overseeing the education of our community students and safeguarding the taxpayers' monies, I must hope for the best while preparing for the worst. I must also oppose any increase larger than 1.5% because of the failure of this board. Until this board has a respectable batting, respectable batting average, I must err on the side of caution. At November's <coughs> finance meeting, our auditor described his concern with our financial culture. When your auditor tells you there is a cultural problem, that tells me there is a tremendous amount of work to be done. He spoke about hundreds of thousands of dollars, possibly more than who knows how many accounts that our central office has no visibility over, and even more concerning, seems to be operating with questionable guidelines. But this wasn't the first we had heard of these accounts. When Commissioner Kirk presented a resolution to investigate these accounts further, uh, to investigate these accounts prior to the audit report, his proposal passed by the slimmest majority. Then at the Finance Committee meeting, where some of these accounts were to be discussed, the issue was given 10 minutes with none of Commissioner Kirk's questions answered, and as of yet, no follow-up. That's a failure of this board. But there are other failures. It is the fiscal controls we promised the voters last spring and never delivered. It is completely redesigning our internal financials so that we would not be projecting another million-dollar-plus deficit. I have all the faith in the world with our finance office, with the right leadership. But as of yet, we, we can't keep telling the voters every year that this is the year we got the fiscal controls right. We told them that story last year. And in the conversation I had with, for those who haven't been at every finance meeting, one of the things that finance director Lavery said really struck me is he said when things calm down, some of the budget tightening will go away, but cer certain controls will still stay in place because they always should have been there. He's not talking about in times of emergency, they just should have been there. So for all that hard work we did last year, we didn't even have the basic controls that should have been there, let alone the extraordinary ones. It is the board passing a hiring freeze resolution that was immediately ignored by the administration and the board showing no resolve to demand adherence to the policy direction we rightfully set for the district as the elected leaders of the school district. It's the board's indifference to the recommendations of financial consultant Ed Gomo including a 1.5% budget increase chief among them. It is the board failing to ask the tough financial questions so that we are now in a position to potentially squander $1.5 million from BED and excess deficit allocation funds for this fiscal year. When we lose Dr. Smith on June 30th, we need a strong board, a board that is strong in demanding financial answers a board that is strong in demanding better educational outcomes. I applaud my fellow commissioners for taking this board from an elected body asleep at the wheel for much of the past decade to one truly engaged and questioning at times from some. But we need more. We need all 14 board members questioning. We need that questioning all the time. That is how healthy elected bodies work. That is how healthy fiduciary boards, of which we are, operate. We are a 14-member board overseeing an organization with 1,500 staff members and roughly $80 million in total expenditures. When we fail to ask the tough questions, we ultimately fail the students, which, is, which are our primary, that's the primary reason why we're here. The board must operate at a higher level of oversight and accountability. At what point do we entertain the notion of sustainability? 1.5% is not an arbitrary number. It's the Northeast Consumer Price Index. Anything above that number is unsustainable. That doesn't mean the district cannot spend greater than the rate of inflation or income growth in future years. However, those years must become the exception, not the norm. We've heard the number tonight on how little, how few dollars these tax dollars would mean to the average homeowner. Over the past decade, while we have mismanaged and overspent, I've heard that same argument. Yet somehow our spending has exploded, a 65% increase while inflation has risen 10%. As the head of the teachers union stated earlier tonight, and Dr. Smith has admitted he's not comfortable with the level of detail he has for the $67 million taxpayer approved school expenditures. Until that level of detail is revealed, it is reasonable to limit budget increases to the rate of inflation, or more preferably, the rate of income growth. If, as some say, 1.75% is not that different than 1.5%, I implore my fellow commissioners to dismiss the arbitrary number of 1.75% and support the sustainable 1.5%. Thank you. <coughs> Further comment on the friendly amendment, or the amendment? Commissioner Matson. Yeah, this will probably be my full comment for the night, but one of the first things that I guess I want to um, at least discuss and put out there is I've heard two commissioners say that 
We've had $12 million in unapproved budget deficits. And budget deficits are something where I've kept a fair amount of work directly in front of me over all time. And I think if you go back to looking at what budget deficits have been incorporated into the next year's um, budget vote, at which time they actually get approved the spending for them, um, depending on your time frame, you know, my, my work, which I, I, I can, I think, document pretty well, shows that the budget, aggregate budget deficits over the past, and we can take different years, and I'll make it look as bad as possible first, the last three years has been uh, $3.1 million. Um, if you go back to 2007 through 2014, it would have been $3.9 million. And if you go all the way back to 2003, it was $2.4 million. Um, you know, I think the numbers are like seven to five over the years as far as deficit versus uh, budget surplus goes. There was one year in which we ended up having to put a deficit in po ex post given a change in valuation of Burlington Telecom and Burlington Electric. Um, I'm still counting that one in there, but that was one that happened. On the flip side, we have this year where there is revenue coming in that um, is sort of the reverse of that, the payment in lieu of taxes being understated, paid by uh, Burlington Elect. But I think it's important that we don't kind of anchor on information that I'm not sure, um, you know, where it, you know, how it fits in. Because $12 million in unapproved spending is one of those statements that I don't think reflects actually the reality. That being said, absolutely, our increases have been above inflation and significantly above inflation. And I think that's something that education spending has seen, not just in Burlington, but across the state and across the states. I think when you talk to people in California, when you talk to people in Oregon, or any of the uh, you know, states that we visit or talk, you know, it, it is the same issue. And what leads to this additional inflation that we have in public education? And I think that's getting to the core question um, that is not really completely a Burlington problem. There's no doubt we've been high. But so, so has overall education inflation. And what are some of the drivers? Uh, Dr. Smith said it, schools are being asked to do a lot more than education these days. And when we get asked to do that, costs come on to our budget. And I don't, I'm not saying it's right that, or wrong that it should be, but it is what's happening. And my concern over the long run is that we do need to be aware of this. We can keep anchor anchored on inflation because it really is how increase in, you know, basic increase in spending. And I think that if public education is going to anchor to spending, public ed education needs to make sure that it is pro providing the services that are expected of public education. I'll acknowledge that one of the challenges in educating any student is making sure that that student is prepared for education. And there are a lot of services surrounding education which literally try to provide those services. Some of them are off budget, like our food service. Some of them are on budget, like the social services we provide. Some of them are direct education. We have to provide our kids the ability to speak English if that is one of the, one of the services that they have not had in their life because perhaps they didn't grow up or even were born in the United States. All these things come together to make the pressures on public education uh, inflation, I think, significantly higher than the general inflation numbers in the United States. Another point about anchoring is that there's something going on in this budget this year that I'd be perfectly happy if we were at a 1.5 percent number, and that would be if we actually looked at, in particular, the bond interest. We have 
$588,000 in additional revenue from bond interest. We have an increased expense line of $780,000. That full seven, and, and those two numbers are literally offsets. It's an accounting change. And it doesn't, there's no tax rate effect from these two things happening, except for that additional 200,000 that came from sequestration. But the 588 in additional revenue last year was accounted for as an expense offset, as opposed to revenue and expense. So that is actually expend, new spending that is not happening, but it's accounted for in that number. And I'd be willing to anchor on inflation if that, if that number, the $588,000, in bond revenue were in fact not looked at as an increase in spending but truly an accounting change. So I do not support the amendment. Can we call the question? Commissioner Dodson? Yeah. Um, Did Charlie call the question? Uh, Commissioner, I'd already oh, I okay. acknowledge Commissioner Dodson. I just like to the, the, I think that the back and forth is um, some of this ground we've gone over and, and I think there are a lot of valid points. Uh, one thing that, that would be helpful to me, I'm thinking back to um, one of our speakers tonight, uh, Mr. Greg Kalinowski, who talked to us about the need to look out into the future and forecast and, and I have not heard very much um, from the supporters of an increased spending at, at the 2% um, a forecast that suggests that we aren't mortgaging our future. That, that really is my biggest concern. I, and this is, I, I think it's fairly objective. I just do not see very much on the horizon that suggests these conversations are going to get easier. Everything I see on the horizon economically, we're seeing a little bit of uptick in economic forecasting, but not for working folks, maybe bankers and some consultants and some, some tech folks, but, but the working person around the way, I haven't seen much to suggest that their real incomes are going to increase. And everything suggests the cost of educating our kids is going to increase. And the mess at, at uh, down in Montpelier does not suggest going to get fixed soon. So, you know, I, there's nothing I hate more than being I told you so, but I would hate to be in a conversation where we've got bigger things to worry about. We've got no equity. We have no equity because people just felt like they were squeezed too hard, that the, the ills of the past were not addressed, and we're in a worse conversation. I think that's quite possible. That's the thing that scares me. I think it's possible to be in a worse conversation in the future, and I'm trying to make as big a down payment now for what everything I suggest says I know we're coming. If someone has a revenue projection or something that suggests it's going to get easier, that it's going to get easier to support teachers, really high quality teacher, it's going to be easier to support one-to-one -one technology and updating our technology and maintaining that technology and getting new buildings. Every principal wants work done in their building. All of these things are going to cost a lot of money. The conversations are going to be more difficult, and we have a very complex district. We also have a, con uh, a district where uh, the tax base is just different. There's a lot of folks for a lot of different reasons who aren't really in a position to contribute, you know, significantly to the tax base. So it puts it on, um, you know, a small number of us. Those are our facts. Those are just the facts. And so it's not that I don't want to spend the money. It's not that I don't want quality education. It's not that I don't care. But we could push hard and get a little bit now and have to give up a lot later. And I'd love someone to speak to that, just out into the future, why they don't think that's, that's what we're looking at, why there's this optimistic money's going to flow, we can, we can you know, reach out to the taxpayers and get the kind of money that we're going to continue to need for years to come. That everything's getting more difficult, and we are in a bad place. The community is in a bad place around these, in my opinion. In my talking to people, I think there's a great deal of division. I think there's a lot of people who are hurting, and um, I, this, this kind of unity and consensus and coming together to educate our kids um, is not the place we are. The, 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 the conversation we're going to need to have to tell taxpayers and the community that you can believe that these things are happening. We actually have objective measures, and we put it on the website. You don't have to, you know, come into to the central office and, you know, um, sort of bug us every day about it. As a matter of course, it is our professional practice to put all sorts of data, not just test scores, but a comprehensive system of why we know that the things we're doing are impacting all children in a very powerful way. I don't see that now. I, we don't have that system as I see, which is part of what helps people dig in their pockets more. So we don't have that currently. Um, and, and so in light of these 
costs, which everything I see suggests are coming down the pike, uh, I really fear um, that we'll, you know, win a little bit of the battle and really struggle in the war as it relates to that cliche. That's one of my concerns. And I, and I haven't heard really talk about the future. Everyone's talked about this year's spending, and I totally grant this year's spending. But if someone could give me a three to five year that says the money's coming, I could look differently at this. Superintendent Smith. Yeah, I just wanted um, to speak to that brief, um, briefly and, and also offer a little bit of context in terms of the, <clears throat> the, the range that we're talking about between the 1.5 and 2, for example. Um, it, a sampling of uh, districts in the region shows that the uh, proposed budget increases that are being contemplated uh, so, so far look to be in the 3 to 4 percent range. That, in fact, is education inflation unless something changes uh, in legislation um, or any of the factors that drive contracts, there, one prediction I can give you is that unless you're prepared to reduce teachers or, or teachers or other employees by the amount necessary to, to bring it down to whatever um, what we considered a sustainable increase, uh, for example, you are going to be looking at for the foreseeable future until something significant changes around those cost drivers of three to four percent growth pressure. If you look backwards, uh, for the last 10 years, um, the budget increases have ranged from 2.8% to 11.7%. This is the low, 2% is the lowest budget increase you've had in 10 years. And I, I haven't gone back more than that, so I don't know um, how much further. You're, you're debating um, a swing of uh, uh, you know, now in tenths of a point. So let's, let's just acknowledge it for what it is. It's, it's about symbolism, not money. Um, if it was about money objectively, um, that's not really the issue when we're talking about a $68 million budget and we're talking about tenths of a percentage point one, one way or another. I really appreciate the, the deep level of thinking that's gone into this and the real soul searching and I know um, that there has been a lot of um, movement um, in, you know, from where people started in their thinking and that it is really something that I hope everybody in the community appreciates because on a 14 member board, that is a tough ask. Um, and now you're down to, you know, in the context of, 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 t of the last 10 years, if, if two years ago you were debating um, against, uh, you know, what you were looking at in terms of a 11.68% um, budget, a plus or minus, uh, you know, a half, uh, you know, and I told you you could have a 2% budget, you'd be dancing in the streets. You know, so it's all about sort of context. And um, I just encourage you to kind of, try to put as much as possible, um, you know, your thinking into, I, I you used the term, Ben, um, which is going to escape me, <clears throat> but an opportunity cost. Um, in, in objective terms, I'll, I'll just say this, you know, the, the, the dollar swings, um, what, you, what you lose potentially every time you go down um, in terms of flexibility to deal with unforeseen problems, in terms of flexibility to actually contemplate restoring something that may have been cut. Um, objectively, relative to the dollars, I do have to say, it, you know, it, it doesn't, from somebody coming new to it, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, that I think, I think it's very important to just kind of focus on the, on the value um, and the opportunities that um, exist around, uh, you know, a, a reasonable approach to this. Um, you know, we gave you our best advice Initially, it was 2%. I've said that, you know, it's not about being stubborn and clinging to that. If a 14-member board could vote for 1.75, I've said it would make it happen, and, I, and, and the fact that it would represent a 14-member vote would be great. Um, barring that, I would just encourage everybody to think um, about, um, you know, where, you, where, where we are right now in, in the context of where you've been in the last 10 years, and just actually take a moment and appreciate that, that you actually have the luxury of debating a difference between 1.5 and 2 in that context, and not to beat yourselves up too much over that and get to the point of, of, of trying to embrace something that you can get behind. I make one quick point, Patrick. Um, uh, yeah, because, quick. Dr. Smith, you actually, I, I am so, so thankful that you are here, uh, so deeply <laughs> thankful. But, but actually, you, you, you made a point that speaks to my concern. You pointed out that 3 to 4 percent is what comparable schools are doing and what educational inflation is. The problem is, if I'm a board member at MMU, CVU, South Burlington, I am much more comfortable making this argument. They do not have the history we have. That's the problem. 
I, I feel much more comfortable than asking for 4%. It is, if you look at, if you look in the papers, you see what's happening here. That's the problem we have is that there's a, there's an inflation rate that is just, you know, normative just to stay even. And it's hard to ask for that in light of what's happened here. That is our problem. They have an easier time to ask it. They have an easier community within which to raise it. And they have a, 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 a history of decent management. Some people say good management. Yeah, that's a foundation on which to do it. So that 10 years, the 2.8 to 11%, there's not a lot in there that I feel comfortable saying to someone, it was so well managed. We use your dollars so well that you should really dig in your pockets. That's the problem. Now, I'm not quibbling with the 3 to 4%. It's what foundation we have to ask for. It. Commissioner Curry. Um, I just wanted to respond to the vision that you illustrated, Commissioner Dodson, um, and I really like that vision, and I think it requires leadership. Um, and right now, leadership is uncertain, and my feeling is that in times of uncertainty, you need the biggest toolbox because it's like renovating a house. You, you start to uncover things and you find out the beam was cut in half behind the sheetrock and the roof is actually caving in. So it's because of the uncertainty that I think we need a bigger toolbox. If we had uh, Superintendent Smith on contract for the next five years, I would be right where you are. But we don't and that makes me nervous on top of all the other uncertainty. Um, and also, I just wanted to let you know that South Burlington actually did have a $7 million deficit, and it was our auditor, Ron Smith, who helped them get out of it when Bob Rustin was there. So those, at least South Burlington has absolutely seen um, those kind, and they just, you know, dealt with a very difficult strike, and I think we actually um, are learning from them. Commissioner Truman, then Commissioner Chena. I'm going to oppose this. Um, I was considering offering an amendment to go to the 2% because I think the community support is there and the wherewithal is there and the dollar figures per taxpayer we were talking about is a relatively marginal difference with, uh, as the, the, not to overuse the term, opportunity cost is to me not an acceptable trade-off. Um, I agree with the point and the intent that I've been hearing, and in particular from Commissioner Shumsky, about the importance of the, the maintaining our financial house and ensuring somehow that we do that. The difference in the two proposals, um, and in the interest of compromise, is why I'm going to not propose the, personally propose the 2%, is because of the efforts that are being done here. That goes to what's the education we're providing, what's happening in the classroom, what's happening in the schools. It's not changing, to me, the commitment and intent, regardless of who the superintendent is, of this board and the community, to ensure that we have financial controls in place that maintain this, uh, that continue us on the path to a soundly managed district. And I think the commitment is there. I think we're putting it together. It may not be there. There are concerns about how things will play out in the future, but there always are. There were 30 years ago about how things are going to be, you know, 25 years ago. That's not going to change. But I can't see my way forward to shortchanging the day-to-day -day operation and the quality of the education we're giving for cuts even deeper than I would like to see in the first place. Thank you. Commissioner Chena. So I, didn't, I, I haven't had any time to prepare anything either, and it's hard to think of something to say because I'm listening to what everyone else says. <clears throat> but, uh, but I feel compelled that I should say something and share my perspective, which I think is different than most that have been heard tonight so far. Um, we sit here talking about sustainability, but I can't sit here and pretend that we're doing anything sustainable. And to, to, to pretend that, changing a number from 2 to 1.5% is sustainable when we're living on a country on land that was invaded, uh, a society built on the backs of slaves and, and, and workers. I mean, nothing we do is sustainable. So I, I think if we're going to talk about moving to sustainability, it's more than a school board thing. I think it's a, it's a bigger picture issue. So that being said, I, I can't frame this as sustainability versus unsustainability. And it's kind of sad to me that we're sitting here bickering between 0%, 1%, 1.5%, 2%, and, 
when 1% of the people on the planet are sucking us all dry and we're sitting here fighting till 11 o'clock at night you know, over a difference of a few dollars a year that people are having to contribute. So I'm, I'm a little frustrated with that and I, I, I'm, I'm just speaking from my heart right now. But we can't change the big picture right now. We're here, we're an elected body focusing on, the, on, the, on, a, on a, a small piece, right? The education system of this city. So that being said, I, I'm trying to, to you know, view my role here as a person who, or as, a, as a, a member of a body whose job is to balance the needs of taxpayers and, ch and the children of our city. And when I think about this from the perspective of taxpayers, I want, I want the rate to be 0% because there's been a lack of accountability. Um, the taxpayers have been taken advantage of in a sense because deficits have been run each year without their permission. But when I look at this from the perspective of children, oh, I wanna say a little more about that, sorry. Like I said, I don't have a prepared statement. <clears throat> Um, that being said, from the perspective of taxpayers, um, <coughs> we have seen some major changes in the culture of our district in the last year. We've seen a shift in the way the board does things, and we've seen a shift in the way the administration does things, and I actually feel very good about this budget, and I feel very good about the, the direction we're going in. I feel like our, our superintendent, the finance committee, our, 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 administrative, our administrators in central office are going in a direction where they're talking about reallocation of resources versus just cutting things. And they're talking about, we're talking about increasing efficiency and increasing accountability. And I think that these motions that we've made, that from the angle of taxpayers, that would give me confidence as a taxpayer, seeing these changes and seeing that we're going in the right direction. When I shift the perspective to the one of the needs of the children, I don't think 2% is enough. I really don't. And I think that our children are worth more than that. Um, you know, I'm highly concerned about, I, I, although I appreciate the reallocation, I am concerned about some of the cuts we're seeing. I think it's sad that we're losing some of our best and brightest teachers as part of this plan. I think it's sad that we're cutting resources to some of the neediest children in our district. Um, and you know, when, in, in this discussion, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, what's the job of the education system and talk about that being academic. But I'd like to point out that the root of education comes from Latin, and the, the word educare or educare, I didn't take Latin. Maybe there's a Latin teacher here still who could pronounce that correctly. But, um, but it comes from educare, which means to bring up or to raise. It isn't to get good test scores, and it isn't to push children through an assembly line so they can be exploited by, by you know, a system. It's to raise up people and to bring people up. And my question is, what does it take, what is it going to take for us to bring up a generation that can help us tackle the challenges that we're going to be facing in the century? Things are not getting better, and there's some talk here about what's going on in the future, what's coming in the future. Let's be honest, that, that unless the next generation comes up with some pretty brilliant solutions, there's not, a lot, there's not a lot of hope for humanity, if you look at what's going on on our planet. So that being said, I think it's unfortunate that we have to sit here debating a number. I feel like we're nickeling and diming the children. A proposal was made tonight by Miriam Stoll, which was 1.75%, a compromise halfway. A point of order, can you please speak to the, to the, uh, the uh, amendment right am now? Am I not doing that right now? Well, I, the, the amendment is... Maybe is, I am out of order, sorry. No, I just make sure you're speaking to Commissioner Shumsky's amendment. All right, well, I disagree with your amendment. I think that, that Miriam Stoll made up compromise earlier before your amendment, no, no disrespect to you and you know that, but Miriam Stoll made, a, made, a, made a, an amendment before you, 1.75%, it was a compromise. I feel like by going back to 1.5%, we're nickeling and diming the children. So I oppose your amendment. I think we should just pass 1.75%. We've talked about this enough. Um, thank you. I'd just like to real quickly say that I, I really think we should take a vote on the uh, amendment. We're talking about the difference right now in what it costs to fill your gas tank in October in Today, you know, it's $15 less, and that's how much it's going to actually cost people. And we're really spending way too much time talking about, you know, $12 per household. And I yeah. think we're getting to a point of posturing. And so I ask us to make our, uh, our, our points, make them briefly. Let's take a vote and let's move on. Commissioner Clayman. Okay, so we're talking about the amendment. Yes. Okay. I guess I just want to say that I respect Commissioner Shumsky's commitment to education. I think you re you are really committed and we're really looking in the right direction in terms of accountability and um, better educational outcomes. But I agree with Commissioner China in that 
a 1.5 percent is still it is it is ridiculously low and it does not give us the opportunity to look at some of these other programs that we're missing. I, su I support our superintendent's position on the 2% in terms of it being very low, historically low. But in Burlington, we have a lot of amazing programs and we're educating the whole child. We're not just trying to get them through a school system. We're not just trying to, to teach to the test. We are looking at, um, particularly in the middle schools, I had spoken with um, one of the principals, gym classes, the food program, um, the social and emotional behavior are all working together because of these programs. If we go down, I, can, I find myself hard, having a hard time supporting 1.75 or anything less than two. So 1.5% is, is just too low. Um, and I think it would just actually get easier to keep lowballing our, our budgets if we start that low at this point. So I cannot support the amendment. Any further discussion on Commissioner Shumsky's amendment? Okay. All in favor of Commissioner Shumsky's amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Uh, I'm going to do a hand vote just to make sure that I don't want to make any clarity. All in favor of, uh, um, of Commissioner Shumsky's amendment, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. All opposed? Okay. All right. the, the amendment fails. Um, I, I, uh, I'm going to make a, a, a real quick uh, suggestion from the, from, and if someone wants to pick this up, this, that's fine. Uh, I, I'm going to, uh, what I, I think will be a friendly amendment to Commissioner Stoll's is to kind of break it into two different pieces. One would be the language that would appear on the ballot, which would be the language that Commissioner Shumsky had with your number. So, shall the voters approve the school department's proposed $68 million? $595,138 budget f uh, for education spending for fiscal year 2016 for current expenses and deficit retirement. That would be the uh, totality of the original amendment. The second amendment, uh, the second, um, not amendment, the, the motion would be uh, to separate it out so that we would have uh, a statement to read the bur the <laughs> It's been late nights. May, may the board affirms its commitment to equitable and adequate provision for socio-emotional services to the district's children and requests the superintendent prioritize funding for such services. And I, there's I'd a like, second part to that. Sorry. There's, there's a, a second, second part to that. that. I'm, so, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the language of the first part, are you, are you, are you comfortable I, with that I, being the, the motion that, because yes, we need to I, pass? The I am comfortable with that, that and I'm comfortable with you they said the second one, and there's, I would just add a, a second clause to that. Can, can I see in case Stephanie, uh, Commissioner Seguino has already added that second she clause? Has in fact I'm, already okay, added. I'm looking at an old <laughs> version of it. I'm sorry. Sure. Would you like what, to read it? Would you like me to read yes, it? Yes, please. Yeah. The second clause or the second, whole thing? The whole thing. whole thing. The board affirms its commitment to equitable and adequate provision of social emotional services to the, the district's children and requests the superintendent to prioritize funding for such services. The board further requests that STEM funding be removed from the FY16 budget and until such time as the board formally moves to sanction exploration of a STEM magnet school. Are you looking at whether I accept that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I do. Um, I think there is just a, a language issue there. Is this the time to pick? I just, I would want to be careful. The board request, further requests that STEM funding, I think that that's a too broad a term because there may already be some funding yeah. that's uh, called STEM. I yeah. would just add additional to that so that makes it clear or some way clarify that we're not just saying we won't fund anything that's STEM. Mm -hmm. um, I also, uh, the first part I do agree with, I think we need to be careful, however, that that's a broad term, social emotional services. It's not well defined. Uh, and I'm just, you know, we do know that the primary mission of the school is education. We can, I'm just wondering if there's some way that we can be a little bit more um, just aware that it may be, what I wouldn't want this to do is to put a superintendent in a place where they therefore felt they had to fund social emotional services above educational services. So I just want to make sure that people don't believe that that, what's that, 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 
is being stated that way. Uh, is, is it about the language issue? Can, can, we, can we clarify language before uh, we, just we discuss it? Language clarification, I think. If you're okay it, with the it, It's meant to be vague and it's meant to be a statement of values to the superintendent, allowing m maximum flexibility, understanding that it's in the context of the removal of, of the, the reduction of social workers, the guidance counselor, and so on and so forth. But the goal is, in fact, to be flexible and to leave some flexibility rather than being too specific. But it is, uh, uh, recognize, recognizes our commitment as a district and what we've heard overwhelmingly from constituents about the concern about those cuts. So that's the reason for it to be vague. May I ask a question of the superintendent? When you read it, is that um, a comfortable direction to have? Um, <clears throat> I appreciate um, being asked. The, um, in general, yes. The, as what I would say, though, as a matter of, of good practice in terms of a board taking an action on a budget like this, um, I, I have to say I don't think it's good practice to single out any specific item um, in the way that you're suggesting, whether, and this has nothing to do with STEM, it could be anything. Um, I think, frankly, the, um, you retain the authority now. Um, it, it's not as if tomorrow we could go and say we're going to have a STEM school you know, next year. There's a level of board uh, authority and board involvement that I think already exists if that's something that you don't want to do. Um, or that you feel needs to benefit from a, um, you know, an extended process. And I don't disagree with the notion of the extended process. So I just, I think um, you're overburdening the, um, the budget resolution by, um, you know, a, a, on a level of detail that I think is, is probably not appropriate. Could I speak to that? <coughs> This is uh, a we really just motion. okay. Yeah, we, we really need to get the language straightened. As to, is, is that what you're? Is that yeah, what you're working Yeah, and it's a separate on? motion. It's not. It's not embedded in the budget, so it's a separate resolution. But we, we have uh, we have an original motion okay. that we're breaking into two separate motions. Right. We have the language for the first half of that motion. We're trying to settle on the language for Got the it. second half okay. of this second Got motion. Um, and do we do we do we have <laughs> do we have may a motion your, on the board? May I ask your could sense you of could you read the <laughs> the motion as yeah, it exists? But actually, um. Superintendent Smith, could you please yeah. respond based on the first part of that as opposed to the STEM part of it? Uh, the um, statement of um, general commitment, do you feel comfortable with that part of it? The board affirms its commitment to equitable and adequate provision of social emotional services to the district's children and requests the superintendent prioritize funding for such services. Is that a comfortable statement? I think direction? that, yeah, because that's a more policy level um, and a, a broader okay. statement, an expression of a general policy direction of the district. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's inappropriate to reinforce a policy direction that is, that is broad, as broad as that. Okay. Um, I'm comfortable with it written as is, with both clauses as is. Could, could someone read the second clause? Because I don't know which one we're on anymore. The board further requests that additional STEM funding be removed from the FY16 budget and, and until such time as the board formally moves to sanction exploration of a STEM magnet school. You're okay with that language, yes, too? I am. Okay, let's take up the first one right now, uh, which is the, uh, the first half of that, which is the actual budget number. Um, Commissioner Porter, you wanted to make a comment on the. On, Okay, so right now we're just talking about the the actual. The, this isn't the this isn't the, the second clause. We've, we've taken the, the no. We're right, but we're only dealing with the first one at this point. Okay, which is the, the which is the which no, <laughs> which is the budget, <laughs> which is the actual budget number. We've we've taken uh, the original uh, motion from Commissioner Stoll, broken it into two parts. Part one is the language for the budget, which will go on the, uh, on the actual ballot. Shall the voters approve the school department's proposed $68 million, $595,138 budget for education spending for fiscal year 2016 for current expenses and deficit retirement? That's the question that we, that's in front of us right now. We'll, we'll figure out the language for the second part after we, we deal with this first one. Commissioner Giannone. Okay, so um, so I'm speaking now um, about the 1.75. Yes. The dollar figure you just. Yes. Okay, so I'd like to say that in 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 the interest of board solidarity, uh, I'm also willing to drop down from my need for a two percent increase, and uh, the reason I'm doing that um, is because is not because that I don't support children as firmly as possible. I come from Ward Three, um, which is the highest concentration of children who need. 
um, special services, et cetera. So the largest concentration of low-income children and families in Burlington is in Ward 3. Um, and just an aside, I've gone, recently I've gone to libraries in, in, at the magnet schools, and I've personally seen, as someone mentioned earlier tonight from the public, so I've seen the, um, the libraries close down because the librarian has a class walk into the room and there's no one else in the room, and so the library actually closes down. Um, I've also attended, uh, I've also observed kindergarten classes in one case where there is um, just one teacher in the room, so there's only one adult. And also in that classroom, there were two children who spoke no English. And so there was a behavior problem, and so I saw the class just totally shut down from its lesson plan. And so the teacher had to deal with the behavior issue for quite a period of time. Um, so I know the needs of, of children to be educated in the best possible way by the Burlington School District. But I also know that um, I study elections a little bit, and I see that increasingly over the last 10 years, more and more people were voting against the budget um, in the city of Burlington, and culminating in last March when over 4,100 people voted against it, which is a record. So I'm gonna respect them, and I'm gonna trust them, and I'm gonna say, well, okay, in, in the name of the fact that uh, the people, including my ward, and, and again, my ward supports the school budget to a greater degree year after year, decade after decade, than any other ward in the city. Um, and yet, I'm willing to say I'll, I'll support the 1.75, the, the dollar figure that was mentioned, um, basically because I trust the voters, and until I see that trend reversed, which is an opportunity this coming March when people can vote for or against this budget, I'm hoping to see that that trend is reversed, and so going forward, that'll give me more information on how to support budgets in the future. So in the name of board solidarity and the fact that the trend has been for more and more people in the city of Burlington to oppose the increases in the budget, uh, I'm willing to support the 1.75 at the dollar figure that was mentioned. Thank you. Right. Any further discussion on uh, part one of this? Commissioner. Chairman. It's for clarification. So what exactly is the question on the table? Are we voting the, the, on something are, that encompasses are, two sections? We are voting strictly. I, I, the, the motion is, shall the following language be put on the, um, on the, the town meeting day ballot? Shall the voters approve the school department's proposed $68 million, et cetera, for budget for education spending for fiscal year 2016 for current expenses and deficit retirement? Thank that you. is the question in front of us. All in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Let's have a hand vote. All in favor of the, uh, the, the motion, which would be the 1.75, please raise their hand. One, two, three, six, seven, eight. I'm in favor. Uh, all opposed? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, the ayes have it. Um, and we have a budget. Um, let's please uh, figure out, can I make a proposal on language um, that would be, you may not view it as friendly, but um, what I would like to suggest is the first clause remain the same about uh, affirming commitment to equitable and adequate provision of social emotional services. Uh, the second part saying just uh, instead of targeting STEM, because I think this is the same uh, it's, it's a not an analogous situation to uh, when Superintendent Smith said he shouldn't have targeted Latin, he shouldn't have named Latin, he should have named the situation and then let it figure out. So instead of naming STEM, uh, have language that would be something like no, uh, no new programs with budget implications um, will be accepted without express board approval. I'm comfortable with that. All right, so our motion, our second part of our motion now is the board affirms its commitment to equitable and adequate provisions of socio-emotional services to the district's children and requests the superintendent prioritize funding for such services. Additionally, no new programs um, with budget implications shall be uh, added without express board approval. Right, can, you, can you read that once more, that last part? Yeah. No new programs with budget implications shall be 
uh, added, mm -hmm. it's not very nice language, but without expressed board approval. Absolutely. And you view that as friendly. Can, can I talk to you quickly? I, uh, it's your motion, please. It's my motion. Um, I, I just think the program, no new programs is, is too broad. Uh, okay. I, I would That's suggest fine. that we focus it on the magnet yeah, schools too. in particular, not saying STEM magnet, but just that there won't be exploration moving towards another magnet school without express approval. Commissioner Halliday, could I offer you Please. an alternative on that? Please. <laughs> the, um, Actually, you know what, I'm going, to, I'm going to call a five minute recess, all right? I'm going to call a five minute recess and what I would like is the people who have some ideas about the language get together, okay. get uh, language, and uh, I'm going to call us back to order at exactly 10.30. Let's okay. go. Okay, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we have some uh, language that's been agreed upon. Uh, Commissioner Curry? Um, so the second part would say um, the board affirms its commitment to equitable and adequate provision of social emotional services to the district's children and requests the superintendent prioritize funding for such services. Additionally, no magnet school programs with budget implications shall be added or expanded without express board approval. Commissioner Seguino, you're, uh, you're okay with that? Okay, uh, is, oh. One minute, do a quick round up. <laughs> right, uh, no, Commissioner, Miriam went to get a drink of water. Oh, I understand. Yeah, me too. It's, it's a, she's, oh. Commissioner Stoll, you're, you're, uh, you're okay with the language that was agreed upon? <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Um, did anyone want to speak to uh, this, what, I guess this is a, a guidance um, document or any, uh, Commissioner Shumsky. So getting back to your points earlier, Dr. Smith, your preference is that it's not being included, it's, it's going into a territory you prefer we don't go into. Would that be accurate? Or? I think that, <clears throat> I'm not sure that there's a need to create something like this now um, and I am concerned about it sort of being paired in the budget context uh, it, while I'm I appreciate the movement away from the level of detail that was first you know incorporated in the statements it is it's a more policy oriented statement which I, I think is fine but I'm always a little cautious about something that's sort of manufactured in the moment um, along those lines that can have a binding effect over so also it's like some indefinite period of time there's no closure is this next year two years three years so I think that as um, although some good thinking has gone into where it is I guess I would urge you to to uh, take a little I don't think there's a sense of urgency about um, you know voting on an, another statement of direction tonight when it might benefit from a little bit more conversation. Thank you. With that said, I would hope that this would go to committee and uh, come back to the full board for a vote at a later date. Thank you. Any further comment, Commissioner Curry? Um, yeah, I just want to say to those folks from Flint School that are still here, um, the, the work you're doing is phenomenal, it's admirable, and the issue is not with STEM itself. This is an old habits die hard issue. Um, we have the first full class from the existing magnet schools graduating this year, and there was supposed to be an evaluation to establish that the gains that have been made were made because of the magnet school model, not because of the middle and upper income kids that went to school there. And we uh, have not had that evaluation. I'm not sure Superintendent Smith knew it was supposed to happen. There's not money in the budget for it. And I feel like it, because we need to move to a board that makes data di driven decisions, it's very important that we do that evaluation before launching another magnet school. Secondly, there was no process around creating another magnet school school, there was no discussion of the need, there was no data presented, it hasn't gone to committees, and I'm, I'm really sorry because the work you're doing is tremendous, and I think I'm probably not the only person who feels that way, so this is absolutely no comment on the work you're doing. It's just all about trying to govern appropriately and um, set in process the kind of data-driven decisions that we need to make as a district. Further comment? Commissioner Truman. 
I'm not comfortable with this resolution. I am completely supportive of the first half and uh, I'm looking forward to voting for that. Uh, regardless of my feelings about uh, the magnet school programs or what we're talking about with Flynn, I feel fairly strongly that this is something that should be developed in committee. I'm just not comfortable with setting this as a baseline policy at this time. Um, and would request that it, I'm not gonna make the motion, but I would suggest that it come out if there is a commitment from the administration and from, I suppose, Finance Committee to address this and bring something to the full board on dealing with the, uh, you know, with the intent of that aspect of the resolution. Hearing no further comment, um, we have, uh, Commissioner Curry, would you read the amendment one more time? Could, uh, could I just? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, the, this STEM um, uh, language emerged not because we as a board are jumping the gun or haven't thought of something, but we're responding to the administration putting forth something that we hadn't agreed on. So what we're trying to do is to signal that we would like that not to happen until we've had a full discussion. I'm open to other ways of doing this, but I, I quite frankly was disconcerted that this has come up several times and that the budget proposal has never been amended to address that concern of the board because this is a governance issue. Uh, so if there's an alternative way of dealing with that, that's fine because I, I really hope that everybody will support the first part of this. But for me, this is a fundamental governance issue. Uh, and as, as uh, Commissioner Curry has said, for too long this district has made decisions without data and evidence. And this to me was a huge leap that really violated the direction we want to go in. So I'm open to other proposals because I would like to see the first half uh, passed. Commissioner Truman. So then my, qu my question is, and again, it's not going to the merits of it, and I think there mm -hmm. are merits to what yeah. you're proposing, is implementation. Is, is this a time sensitive issue in terms of setting the funding and, and hiring or not hiring that prevents the board from taking any action at its next meeting or a f upcoming meeting on this particular point. Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing that up because um, I guess I wouldn't, as superintendent I care right now, I don't interpret any action the board has taken tonight to date as in any way authorizing us to go forward with uh, um, plans to develop a program for next year. Um, I think, um, <clears throat> and I can tell you that any any proposal to, to um, even look at the issue, um, I would say right now, would be would reflect some of the considerations that are been raised from as a matter of good practice in terms of investigation, evaluation, all those kinds of preceding factors. I just think it's not a, a, a the best practice to get that specific right now. Again, when you're not, um, I don't think any action is required um, to offset some something that has somehow been put in motion. So then as, as a, as a follow-up piece of it, would you, for practical purposes, you know, for, you know, for, for example, the proposals that came out, you know, the documents for the budget, would you agree to take that out of the current considerations of this position as, you know, as, as a part of what your plans are, pending the board having a chance to have that discussion? Does that meet? Do you understand? Because if we're having this talk about it and the board is kind of, how formal should the board action be in setting its intent about, you know, if, if indeed something like this passes, its intent about the program versus let's continue to have this conversation so it's off the table in terms of, look, here is where, now that we've got the budget dollar figure, here's where we're going to be moving forward, that that's not automatically going to be in there until we have that conversation, if there's a commitment of that kind. And then, of course, it's up to the, 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 the board to decide whether or not that's enough. Um, I, d I don't want to... Not uh, articulate uh, Right, well. no. And I appreciate that. So I, and I, I don't want to drag it on, um, except to the, the, ex the extent to which you're, we're getting into some things which I just would caution you as a, as a board um, about the level of detail. For example, you've adopted a budget um, that's different than a budget that we proposed. <laughs> so the first thing we have to do is go back and make some adjustments. All right, we, we gave you one, a two and we gave you 1.5. We, I think we need to be given the opportunity without the board being too 
um, overly directive right now to come back to you with, we have to give you a plan for 1.75. Um, and then you can evaluate the appropriateness of it. And I think to, I appreciate, for example, that you've given us the latitude to do that work up to now without um, saying it's got to have this or it shouldn't have that. I would just ask for you to allow us to take that next step without, um, you know, providing any more specific directive that it should be this or it shouldn't be that. Commissioner Seguino. So, Commissioner Holliday, I'll leave it to you to instruct us on how to do this, but I would propose then that we delete the second sentence in part two of the motion. So on, we're going to... On the magnet schools and simply retain the first statement. I think, do I have to approve of that? I think I do. Yes. Um, I, um, one of the things that's been difficult for this in this particular point for me is that um, this idea has felt as though it's been slipped to us several times and the reason I wanted to put something clear down is I feel like the magnet schools um, don't clearly fit into one of our committees they bounce around they aren't clearly a finance they aren't clearly a curriculum and over the year I've been at the, on the board, two years, I've watched it kind of bounce around and nothing happens and we talk about it. There have been several times where we've gotten really interesting presentations about what's going on um, at Flynn and yet it falls through. My, my concern is that I just don't want that to happen again. I don't want us to sort of let it bounce around and I really think there is a lot of interest in the community and going forward in, in another magnet school. I think we owe it to the community to talk about it in a formal way. I would be I would be more comfortable in accepting this and just taking this off if we as a board made a commitment to look at that question and maybe look at it within the next couple of months and figure out what committee should be talking about it and where, how can we get that going, the evaluation you're talking about. And if we made a commitment to do that as a board and to work with, with Howard on that, I would be comfortable taking it out. But I, I wouldn't if we just left things as is tonight. So uh, what, what I would suggest then is <coughs> removing the second sentence and that I would direct uh, Commissioner Dodson as the chair of the curriculum department to work with uh, uh, Stephanie Phillips and with Howard Smith to set up a plan for, um, for uh, a, a clearer understanding of uh, the, the proper location of um, discussions around the magnet schools. I would be happy with that. Right. Commissioner Dodson is, uh, I think curriculum is the, the yeah. most natural fit for that. I agree. Okay. And so the amendment we now have, uh, the motion we now have, Commissioner Curry? Uh, that, that the board affirms its commitment to equitable and adequate provision of some social emotional services to the district's children and requests the superintendent prioritize funding for such services. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. All right, well done, <laughs> everyone. I know it's a long and I know we're fighting, or not fighting, I know there's discussion over very, very minute, um, but, uh, but, but significant issues as well. The, 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 what they representative, what represented was significant. Uh, we have in front of us a consent agenda. Can we get a motion for approval of the consent agenda? Commissioner Truman, seconded by Commissioner Seguino. All in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda passes. Uh, Commissioner uh, Chino, would you please give us a brief update on the superintendent search? Commissioner Chino, can you please give us a brief update uh, super progress toward the superintendent search and some important dates coming forward? Did you say brief? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I did. So I'll try to keep it brief. So, um, succeed. So did you say succeed? I said succeed. There is no try, do or do not. All right, so, um, so uh, this week, we, I'm, I'm going to try to keep it really brief, and if people want more details, please, you know, see uh, the minutes online, and also I wrote an article in the North Ave News that you can refer to that gives a lot of detail about what's coming up, but this week, a joint uh, meeting of our superintendent search advisory committee and ad hoc search committee um, reviewed the first round of, of, of uh, candidates and narrowed the pool down to six people. Next week, we are going to have six interviews. These are confidential interviews. Um, out of those six interviews, we hope to have two or three finalists. Those names will be made public, and there will be 
um, a series of interviews on Friday, January 30th. The details will be, are still being worked on about where and when, but there's going to be a student interview, a teacher staff interview, a community interview, and that, which are all public, and then there's going to be a confidential full board interview. Um, our, our search firm is going to collect input at each of these interviews and then present that data to the, to the full board and then the full board will take the data from all interviews into account when we make our final decision. Um, I'm going to be sending emails out to students, community members and teachers tomorrow morning. Um, so if anyone out there is interested, you can, you can contact me through the Burlington School District website. Um, you can find my email there. and we can bring you into the process. Thank you. And I, I have to very briefly uh, thank publicly uh, Commissioner Chena for an, an unbelievable uh, amount of time and effort put into uh, a very, very difficult job. And so Thanks. thank you for that. <laughs> Commissioner Stoll, I'm guessing we've dealt with finance tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Commissioner Kirk, ITC. Uh, it's all on the website minutes. We get we uh, really don't have a lot to report. We're looking into accessibility. We're looking into seeing on top and horizons, and we're looking into uh, some issues at Champlain. So. All right, uh, Commissioner Seguino. Uh, I'm just going to encourage you to read the minutes. Uh, we have been talking about. Uh, the uh, efforts to improve uh, the way that discipline and behavioral management is done. And I encourage you to read the minutes and contact me if you have any questions. Curriculum, Commissioner Dodson. Uh, quickly, we continue to move apace with uh, understanding the, the efforts we have um, in terms of instruction and moving towards literacy proficiency. We've begun a uh, process led by uh, Curriculum Director Stephanie Phillips of going um, and having teachers from schools come and talk to us about their practice, talk to about their assessments, and that started with some uh, teachers from Champlain. That went great. So we're trying to set up the next one, but for this month, we believe that the uh, SAC community um, process might uh, conflict, so we might have to move things around a little bit, but, but we're moving forward with that, and we think it's going well. Uh, Commissioner Truman, I know you have two motions. Uh, we actually uh, have one motion, and in the interest of time, I'm going to, well, first of all, I, I want to apologize. Apparently, our minutes are missing. They've gone missing, so we'll rectify that and get that out there um, from the meeting. But the uh, salient por portion of that is a uh, proposal for policy changes that are, um, if you haven't yet, uh, there's a summary memo from uh, attorney, our attorney, Susan Gilfillan, uh, regarding policy changes that are being made in concert with a settlement agreement, um, as it says here, resulting from a complaint filed by a student with the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights uh, related to uh, Title X rights as a pregnant and parenting student. And as part of that settlement agreement, uh, certain policy changes are being proposed. The policy, uh, Governance Policy and Advocacy Committee um, vetted those, made some recommendations which were adopted and incorporated into it to clarifying certain things of uh, definitions of harassment and particularly it designates um, a Title IX coordinator for employees, students, parents, and others. Um, the uh, OCR insisted that it that we needed to name that person in policy. Um, that's being done, uh, so d it, this designates Denise Bailey, uh, human compliance manager, as that coordinator and provides for, uh, uh, instructs the superintendent to promptly appoint a successor in the occasion that there is a vacancy in that. Um, all that information, there is a, the first piece of what's on board docs is a uh, memo of the proposal, uh, its impact, and a little bit of history and why. And the propose uh, the sorry, hold on. F1 uh, the policy changes are. Uh, I guess we'll need to do this in uh, two parts. One is I move uh, first reading of policy F1R policy on the prevention of harassment of students. Do we have a second? Second. Commissioner uh, Curry. Did you need to speak to it any further? No, I think I did. The, the changes are relatively limited and they're obvious they're on board docs. Any discussion? 
All in favor of first reading of prevention policy F1R, prevention of harassment of students, please say aye. aye. Opposed? And the other is, I guess that's um, policy A4, equal, oppor equal employment opportunity and non-discrimination policy. And it, uh, many of the same changes in that, it's uh, overlapping. So I'll move uh, adoption of that. Second for from first reading. Yes. Second from Commissioner Giannone. Any discussion? All in favor of uh, first reading of policy A4, equal, oppor equal employment opportunity and non-discrimination policy, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Anything further? Thank you. Nothing from uh, committee. Again, before we adjourn here, I, I do want to say thank you for um, a discussion that was um, th that was on the facts, that reflected people's individual uh, uh, opinions, but was uh, focused on the topic, not on individuals. Uh, that's the way that a board moves forward and uh, and um, and is more productive. I'd just like to add my expression of appreciation also for. Um, a lot of hard work on everybody's part to um, really come to grips with, uh, with, your, with the challenge you face of representing what I uh, continue to uh, learn is a very diverse, in many ways, <laughs> uh, set of outlooks in the community. And, um, and I think the community um, should feel some comfort in the fact that I think a pretty good range of them were represented in the comments tonight. And a particular thank you to all on the Finance Committee for several, several meetings, each several hours of work for, uh, for, for vetting this and bringing it forward. And uh, of course to uh, our senior administration for preparing uh, what even people who were not fans of this referred to as a, as a, a cogent, coherent, thoughtful, clear um, discussion on what a budget should be and could be. So with that, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Commissioner Chena, seconded by Commissioner Porter.